Seeing that we have a majority of the town council present, I am calling this public forum to order at uh, 631. And I'm turning over to Andy Steinberg because we are also calling a meeting of the Finance Committee on case they would like to review this issue after the public forum. And we have a quorum of the Finance Committee present, and so I'll call the Finance Committee to order. Okay. Um, this is a public forum regarding the allocation of the Town of Amherst funds, specifically Community Preservation Act funds, as the required match to a grant for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for the construction of a playground at Kendrick Park. Um, the charter requires that we publish this in advance, which we have. It also requires that we hold a public forum because we are doing appropriation of money out of cycle. And it also means that we have an opportunity to hear from the public regarding this issue. Without further delay, uh, David Zomak, our assistant town manager, is going to provide us with a brief overview of the plan. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time tonight. Um, I will try to be very brief. I know that the council has heard about this project, um, and I know there are others uh, behind me, representatives of various boards and committees who may want to speak later uh, during your regular agenda about this, about this topic. Um, if I could have the next slide. I'm going to run through a few slides here that we used during the process with the CPA committee and the finance committee. Um, as the town council knows, um, recently uh, the town uh, was excited to receive a $400,000 grant uh, through the park grant. This is a state grant, a competitive grant uh, that is awarded uh, to communities throughout Massachusetts to improve public parks, um, sometimes commons, We've applied a number of times. We've gotten grants for War Memorial Pool and Mill River Pool, and we were fortunate this time to get a grant uh, to uh, hopefully uh, improve Kendrick Park. Um, back in as early as 2008, 9, 10, 11, right in that period, um, the town spent considerable time. Many volunteers came together and uh, worked uh, with the then town manager and a variety of boards and committees to create a design for Kendrick Park. As part of that design, there was, uh, let's see if I can get which one, maybe Athena can, oops, no, 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 if you, I'm sorry, stay on that, I just want to show where we are, but these, maybe Athena, you could point out with your mouse where we are in Kendrick Park over on the left hand side. If you go north, north, keep going north, oh, come back south, right in there. Oh, it says play area right there. So if you go over into the park, that is where the playground is proposed to be. As I said, we got a $400,000 grant. Um, this plan um, is in early design phases. So in other words, the placement of the, of the playground is where the committee um, proposed it to be. The actual design is what uh, we are proposing to pay for with part of the grant. So the LSSE Commission, Public Works, the Planning Department have all had informal discussions about uh, what the park might look like. And if we scroll down, uh, we'll take a look at um, so as part of the, the design, uh, we did get together with some staff uh, and LSSE was briefed on this and talked about a very simple park. This would not be a spray park. This would simply be a playground uh, with accompanying associated walkways that would really uh, be the first step in the town's process to, to bring life to Kendrick Park. It's a wonderful public space. Um, but really there isn't much to do there other than passive recreation at this point. So we had to come up with a preliminary design and that's what you see on the screen before you. Um, as I said, it would include walkways, a playscape, uh, shade structures, um, and it would work well within the, the existing uh, topography of the park. Um, next slide. Um, this really lays out um, a rough budget for the, uh, both the design and the construction, a total project cost of about $660,000 with 400 of that coming from the state 
and the remaining share is what we sought uh, and received a recommendation from CPAC. Uh, and and that, that's what brings us here tonight. So I think okay. I'll stop there. Thank you. Just to uh, inform the audience during our regular meeting, which will begin right after this meeting, we will actually bring this appropriation to a vote. And at that point, we will hear the report from CPAC. Right now, the requirement for public forum is that 50% of the time is devoted to public comment. So I am asking for you to raise your hand if you would might like to make public comment regarding Kendrick Park. I do know that there is someone from LSSE here who might like to make public comment. Why don't we go ahead and do that? Yep, go ahead. Hello, my name is Rebecca Demling and I'm here representing LSSE tonight. Um, the LSSE Commission voted unanimous, unanimously to support this project. Um, on July 27th, uh, June 27th, 2019, we held a public forum that was well attended um, and received very strong support for the project going forward. Is there any further information about the nature of that discussion you'd like to share with us? Um, a lot of people had uh, input on what type of structures they'd like and what kind of fencing or barriers they would like to have, but um, LSSE is planning a robust public input process on the playground, similar to what was done for Groff Park. So I'm sure we're keeping our, uh, the committee is keeping their minds open as to the direction the residents would like us to go in. Okay, thank you. Are there any other public comments regarding this? We're gonna just look at each other for about three more minutes. I'm sure there's nobody else out there who'd like to talk about Kendrick Park. You could even ask a question. Please come forward. Please come forward to the mic. State your name. Good evening, I'm Laura McLeod, and I'm just curious to know what environmental um, aspects have been considered for the park. David, if you answer that question, it's not counted. It's counted at, as 50%. Okay, um, that's, a good, that's a very good question. Uh, the park, I guess, we're, I, I would start by saying we're, we're really, what was shown on the, on the screen was really a very preliminary design. We just took a look at the available space. So a whole design process would move forward from here. And in fact, on January 9th, if the town council decides to move forward with this, we would hold our first uh, or one of a series of public meetings where we're gathering more input. So uh, the, the location that we've proposed is really part of an old um, uh, streetscape, if you will. There were houses in the park itself. Um, there is one underground stream. The Tan Brook does go under Kendrick Park. It's, it's in a culvert under the park. We are not proposing to daylight that. We are going to make sure we avoid that area. This will be farther north in the park. So um, we will also, of course, work with our, um, our tree warden, Alan Snow, has been uh, around the table talking with uh, us about what trees um, might need to be trimmed. Are there any possibilities that trees might be um, uh, needing to be removed? All of that would be determined during the design process. So uh, we'll avoid the stream that is underground and we'll um, do the best we can to keep as many trees as we possibly can. Okay, thank you. Are there any other people who would like to make public comment regarding Kendrick Park? Okay, we have met the requirement of 50% put aside for comment. So I am going to conclude this part of the meeting 
uh, of the public forum officially. At the same time, however, Andy Steinberg is picking up with the Finance Committee. And Andy, I'm going to let you go ahead. Okay. Um, I know we uh, have at least one member of the committee here who's not a member of the council, Mary Lou, I think. Um, so do you want to come um, see if somebody can let you squeeze into their space for just a moment? Come on over. If you're on the finance committee, don't leave. Because <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that this is going to take long. Let me explain what's going on. Um, the Finance Committee does not like to take final positions on um, recommended financial orders if there is going to be a public forum until we've had an opportunity to hear from the public. Normally what would happen is that um, the forum would not be on the same night as the vote would be taking place so that we have space to have a meeting in between, but that was not possible tonight. One of the things that was mentioned in the Finance Committee report that's very important to know is that if we don't act by the end of this month, um, then we have not met the grant requirement and we lose the grant. So that uh, the council, if it's going to do anything, um, must act this evening. Um, the Finance Committee had previously uh, taken a vote and recommended four to zero with one council member absent to recommend financial order 2045, which we can discuss in more detail later. And I think that the sole question right now is um, for the Finance Committee whether um, there's any member of the Finance Committee that wants to recommend changing um, the recommendation based upon the forum and if not, uh, then I would uh, take a motion to adjourn, uh, be, and that would leave our prior order standing. I move that the Finance Committee adjourn. Second. So this motion to adjourn, um, I usually ask uh, the members who are non-voting members of the Finance Committee if they have any comment to offer. Frequently, the answer is a shake, a, not, a shake of the head, the no, but um, I do want to make that offer, as I always do. So there's no comment. So all members of the Finance Committee in favor of motion to adjourn uh, the Finance Committee meeting, please uh, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. 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 So it's uh, unanimous and uh, I think five to zero. So. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary Lou, for being with us. Um, Mary Lou's been a great member of the committee and has helped me with a lot of the drafting and um, contributed her con considerable expertise in that regard, too. Pub public comment on this is over, but we will have general public comment in the next round. Okay? All right. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take a brief recess. But I, before you do that, Scott, where's your photographer? Okay, thank you. I'd like the council to convene right in front here. He promised me five minutes. Okay. Seeing as we have a quorum of the council present, I'm waiting for two more people, um, we are going to call the regular meeting of the town council to order, and it is um, 6.50. Okay, and the first order of business is the election of officers, and Athena, you will begin that process. The excuse me, Athena is the clerk of the council, and this is the responsibility that she has, among many, that she must run the election for the president. Thank you. Thank you. Charter section 2.2 .2 requires the town council annually to elect a president and vice president who shall serve a one-year term. The Town Council Rules of Procedure, Section 2.1a, state that the Clerk of the Council shall reside, preside over the election of the President. Lynn will take over after we elect our President for both terms. So the process will be that I will ask for nominations. Nominations do not require a second. Councilors may nominate themselves. After each nomination, I will ask the Councilor nominated if they accept the nomination. 
If there are no further nominations, I will ask each nominee if they would like to make a brief statement. I will then call for the roll. Please state either the name of the nominee you wish to vote for as president or abstain. At the conclusion of the roll call vote, I will announce the results. The nominee who receives a majority of votes will be deemed elected as president. If no nominee receives a majority of votes, I will repeat the process beginning with accepting nominations. The council will elect a president for a term to end January 6, 2020 and for a term to end January 4, 2021. I will swear in the president after both terms are elected. The floor is open for nominations. Councilor Pam. Um, I nominate uh, Lynn Griesmer. I think she has listened to uh, the counselors and to the public and has been fair. Do you accept the nomination? I do. Are there any other nominations? I don't know how we do a point of order during an election process like that. Go ahead. So a nomination is putting someone's name into play. Then they're later going to be asked to give a speech. If we're not going to be given any opportunity to ask questions, which I have not heard of yet, I don't think it makes sense that the person making the nomination should be giving a speech about why they're nominating an individual. I think we are still working out how this works. And if we're, if we're limited, as we have been instructed thus far, to names and, and speeches by the actual people nominated, that's what we should be limited to. Are there any other nominations? All right, I'm going to call the roll. Councillor Ball Milne? Yes. Can, can I just ask, are we voting on both the one month and the one year? We're voting for a term to expire January 6, 2020 first. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead and make your statement. Did you want to make a statement? You should. Yes, I should make a statement before you vote. Can, can, I have, um, can I have a first point of, of order also? I'm honored by the nomination. Uh -huh. uh, whether this sounds like it's a ridiculous statement, but I've actually totally enjoyed this year. Uh, I am still of sound mind and body. The body's a question mark, but the mind is still fine. Uh, but very truly, this has been one of the most interesting opportunities, and I do mean that in the most positive way, for me to bring together uh, my professional life, my education, and my, le my life lessons learned uh, in a way that has made me feel terrific about the group of people that were elected to serve on this council. They are fair, they are kind, and they every day work on behalf of the town of Amherst. And it is truly heartening to have such a terrific first council. Are we ready to vote? Hearing no discussion, we're going to go ahead and call the roll. Councillor Ball Milne, you can vote for the person you would like to elect president, or you can say abstain. Yes, for Lynn. <laughs> Councillor Brewer? Abstain. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Um, I'm looking for a name or abstain. Oh. <laughs> My name or her name? <laughs> Ralph Waldo Emerson. <laughs> Lynn, Lynn Griesmer. Councillor Dumont? Lynn Griesmer. Councillor Griesmer? Lynn Griesmer. Councillor Haneke? Lynn Griesmer. Councillor Pam? Lynn Griesmer. Councillor Ross? Lynn Griesmer. Councillor Ryan? Lynn Griesmer. Councillor Shane? Lynn Griesmer. Councillor Schreiber? Lynn Griesmer. Councillor Steinberg? Lynn Griesmer. Councillor Schwartz? Abstain. All right, congratulations, President Griesmer. We're going to repeat this process. I'm sorry. It was 11 in yes and two abstentions. We're going to repeat this process for a term to expire January 4, 2021. I'm going to open the floor for nominations. 
Go ahead, you have to die. Councilor Shane. Um, I, I have a question on order. Um, I wanted to raise an issue and to talk about the potential of holding the election for the one year term on January 6th rather than now, but I don't know whether I should raise it before. It's not a question of who's being nominated, but uh, what's the role of the president, a longer discussion. So I don't know whether I would offer that now or offer it there after we get a nomination. So that's, I, I don't know at what point I do say something. There's no, it, Alyssa's telling me there's no provision for discussion here, but, but that's what I'm asking about. Even though I haven't been sworn in, I am president at the moment. Uh, I believe that if the council would like to have a discussion about that, they should go ahead and do so. And you might want to provide your rationale for wanting to delay the full election for a year until then. Okay, um, I will. I I want to be as brief as possible, and that's one of the risks reasons I'm asking for a delay because I looked at how full our agenda is tonight. So I didn't want to have a full discussion. And, and I also want to make it clear this is not about a contested election the way when we were, if everyone can remember last December, where I, it was an extremely long process. So I think it would be good for us to have a discussion after a year on the role of our president, the role of our vice president, how that interacts with committees and committee appointments and gives all counselors um, opportunities should they want them to grow and experience being chair and being on different committees. And if you take a look at the committee appointments right now, you'll see to some extent our officers are often on many committees that are very important committees. So they're both the officers who are meeting regularly with our town manager and planning agendas, but they're also on key committees. And thinking about, do we want that to be a small group or do we want to spread it around? And I thought if we postpone the election for the one year, we could have it in the context of committees and how all of that works. So again, this was not about the particular position. And I didn't think it was uh, we have enough time to have that discussion tonight. Otherwise, I would have proposed having that discussion tonight. So this is to talk about uh, what is the role of vice president, president vis-a-vis -vis our committees, how we all interact, um, and make sure we're not developing an internal power structure that future council members, you know, five years from now, would look at it and say, gee, it got too centralized. We want to invite people in and have people a chance to grow and learn. So that's the discussion I'd like to have that would be the longer one. And that would be my only reason, actually, for delaying the one-year vote, because I think a vote gives us all the energy to have longer discussions. I think at this point the question is, do you wish to place in motion to delay the vote for the term of president and vice president to January 4th, 2000, I'm sorry, January 6th to 2020, at which point we would vote for a president and vice president for a year going to January 4th, 2021. That is the motion I would be making about just the one year, not the, the one month. Is there a second? I second it. Okay. Is there further discussion? Dorothy? Darcy? Darcy. <laughs> Um, uh, I guess I would say that I, I agree that it makes sense that we take some time with this. Um, I, I watched the video from the, the meeting a year ago, and, <laughs> and there were, you know, a lot of issues that were brought up in that meeting and, and requests to clarify the roles of, well, especially the vice president, but also the president, which, and questions that have never really been answered. So, um, I, I think it would be really nice for this council to be able to have that discussion in the context of the, of the election, uh, the one-year election. Um, and it makes sense to me to do that in January. Um, other, other, yes, Alyssa. 
That rationale is the reason I abstained, because we had zero discussion about when we were going to have the election. We were just told we were going to have an election. We didn't have any discussion about how we might discuss the issues from last year. I'm a little concerned that if we have the pressure on us, however, to do it in January and then vote again in January, because we just voted for a term, we'll have to have the discussion and the vote the same night. Whereas in a perhaps more ideal world, we might have separated those two things. We could easily have had this discussion in October or November and then had the vote a couple months later. And so we are up against that time pressure now, and so I'm not quite sure what to do with that. But given where we are right now, I think it would not hurt us at all. I don't think we needed this vote tonight to extend the term into January in the first place. And there's no charter police to tell us that. And so I think we're fine with waiting until January, but I'm, I'm still a little uneasy that January is still going to be discussion and then vote that night. But if that's the will of the council, then that's how it should be. Okay. Any further conversation at this point? There's a motion on the floor. It's been made and seconded. The motion, in essence, is to delay the vote for the president and vice president that would take terms from January 6th 2020 to January 4th, 2021. Is there any further discussion? Yes, Shalini. I'm in favor of having a discussion, and I also want to acknowledge that this my decision to do that is not suggesting that I want to change. I just want to be very clear that I'm very, very appreciative of the work that both Lynn and Mandy Jo are putting in. So this is not you know, because of any concerns around that, but I think at the same time, it, uh, now that we have been in council for a year, it's good to look back and see what might we do differently. Dorothy. Um, because of the open meeting rule, uh, we, or at least I, don't get together and talk about these things. So we have to talk about them in a meeting, and, and we didn't have that meeting. So okay. I just think for a really smooth year, it's good if we have that chat. Okay. Any further comments? Evan. Yeah, I think it's a good idea to have that discussion a year in. Um, my concern is that I think it's the idea being we don't have enough time to do so today because we have a very packed agenda. Um, but I have no expectation that our agenda on January 6th will be any lighter um, unless we make clear uh, that it's our intention that that could be a time-consuming discussion and we would want it to be an agenda item carved out um, and not overload the agenda on that day. But then I wonder if what Alyssa said about how it might be uncomfortable to have that discussion under the pressure of then having to immediately have a vote, if it makes more sense to have that discussion tonight, given that we're always going to have a packed agenda. Pat. Um, I agree with um, Evan. I feel like the discussion is critical. It's important. It is not about judging you. I think that was very important to state. But my feeling is we are involved in essence at the beginning of the discussion now. So I guess where I differ is perhaps we need to have the discussion now and the vote at the following meeting. Okay. Mandy Jo. The only thing I would caution is our agenda doesn't have this listed as a discussion item, and if there are members of the public that would want to weigh in on public comment, they won't have a chance if the will of this body is to have that discussion if that discussion occurs tonight. Alyssa. I completely disagree with that framing. By posting it on the agenda, the topic has been posted. It does not matter if it says, will it entertain public comment on the item or not. That is not what the open meeting law is looking for. The open meeting law is looking for whether or not we've advised the public that there's a topic tonight. The public, in fact, may have been surprised that the topic had zero discussion whatsoever under the original plan. So I, I do not believe that the open meeting law in any way says that we have to specify which of our items are going to have discussion and which are not. As as long as we make clear what items we're talking about to a level of specificity that people know that we don't just say election, but like we say election of officers. Um, Kathy. Okay, this is, I was hoping to avoid 
having to, to start the discussion on. Well, but, you're going to. But, but this is actually one of the reasons I wanted, I actually wanted it to be a clear item on next meeting agenda and, and anchored so that all of us would between now and then be thinking about it, you know, rather than, oh, that's an interesting idea, and actually come prepared on how do we think the year went? What do we think the role should be? Do we have different opinions? I didn't want to make it on the fly. And that's exactly why I was trying to do it, not in the context of a contested election, but just purely we, we like our officers, but let's take this time, if we're voting on a whole nother year, to have, and yes, Evan, I agree, we should carve out discussion about role, committees, you know, and have it, and then the end of it is, is an election, but we know that the election is going to be the one thing we're voting on. We're voting more on other content. So that was the reason I wanted to split the two, to give us a president and vice president that would still be here <laughs> and conducting the meeting. Is, are there any other comments? Mandy Jo. My, my comment is actually a question of procedure. The charter, I think, um, says something about sort of the first order of business should be elections. And a topic of discussion about the role of a president and vice president is not, it, it may be related to an election, but it is not the election. If our terms, or if your term expires on the 6th, is it possible to have a discussion before the election under the charter? It's just a, a question I have about timing of agendas, and I hate bringing it up, but I, I don't want us to run into the same issue when setting an agenda for the 6th if the charter would require the election to be held before the discussion of the topic. The potential solution is to elect to like the eighth or something instead of the sixth. <laughs> we are presently scheduled to meet on the 6th of January and the 27th of January. So one of the options is to delay the election for a term till the 27th. That mean, means we should go back and redo the vote. And then on the meeting on the 6th, this would be an agenda item. It would give the public dual notice. Um, I do want to stress, however, that it's an election of the council, not of the public. You've elected us. And if you don't like us, get rid of us. But we elect, you elect, the, the council elects the president. Yes. Doesn't the charter say that the election can be revisited any time? It does. I don't see the harm of voting tonight. Vote tonight, discuss January 6th. If we don't like the way we voted, we can call for another vote. Darcy, you had your hand up. I just wanted to say that I think that the, the discussion that I'm kind of envisioning would include, would integrate some of the stuff that the GOL has been talking about, about you know, reorganizing committees, trying to figure out workloads of, of uh, council members. And I think that is all related to the role of the president and the vice president. So it seems like since we're already gonna have, I guess, that conversation, um, this to me seems like it, it goes together. The, the two discussions. And that conversation is scheduled for the 6th. GOL? That I don't know. What GOL had in mind was a report to, but we haven't had this discussion yet, so we'll see what happens later tonight, but um, we were planning to issue or provide a report to the council on our deliberations about committees and how well they're working and make some suggestions. This was not something that we have talked about, uh, though we could, um, but that's just five of us. And it sounds like this body would like to have this discussion with all 13. I'm feeling that I'm uncomfortable putting these two together. I'd like to separate elections from discussion about how well this body functions and, and issues about presidents and vice presidents' duties. 
Um, I'm sort of sympathetic to uh, Steve's suggestion that we, we vote. We can always undo a vote if we want. But th this is on the agenda. It's right in front of us. Um, we can talk about this at the next meeting or any subsequent meeting. Um, but I don't see, uh, I just, I'm very uncomfortable with the thought of us having a long discussion on the 6th and then turning to a vote. Um, the vote's on the agenda, let's vote. Um, and we can, uh, GOL can certainly, you can ask GOL to take this up. We certainly can take it up as a body on the 6th. Um, and we can talk about it as much as we like. But I'm uh, getting a little uncomfortable with the, the connection of voting with a broader discussion. Um, that's, I guess, my thought. Okay. There's a motion on the floor. The motion on the floor is to defer the election of the president and vice president beyond January 6th, 2020, uh, until the meeting on January 6th, 2020. Are people ready to vote on that? Alyssa. I'm flummoxed by the idea that someone would want to completely separate an election of a person from a discussion of the performance of that person. That's like talking about rehiring the town manager before you have his evaluation. So we didn't discuss whether or not we were going to do an evaluation. We never got around to having that conversation. Now we're in the place of having to have a discussion. Everyone is going to assume that we worked this out outside of this room because we're having no discussion. How does this not look strange to people? So we made, you know, we, we've been doing just a lot of stuff. We've been really busy. We maybe didn't think this through very well. But there is no rule that says we had to have this election tonight. That is not what the charter says. The charter says annually. It did not mean after the election on December. It meant in January. We didn't have to do this. Just as an election can include discussion, an election is not. There is no legal definition of de election that applies to this group that says you can't talk about stuff during the election. You have to hold the election and have the discussion a different time. So we're bollocksing ourselves up in something crazy here. Let's do what makes sense to the most people, do it on the night that makes sense to the most people, but this is what happens when you don't have a discussion, when you just get something dropped on you. And I absolutely do not think the public should have any public comment on this item ever, because as you clearly stated, this is a town council decision. Just to be clear, this was on the December 2nd yes. agenda at 5.30, so this got delayed from that because of the snow. Um, all right, there is a motion on the floor. We either are going to go forward with that motion, the motion is, Xena, would you read the motion, please? To delay the vote for president and vice president's one-year terms from January 6, 2020 to January 4, 2021 to the January 6, 2020 town council meeting. Is there further discussion? All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand and say aye. 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 All those in, opposed, raise your hand and say nay. nay. Abstain. Okay, we will now have that election on the 6th given that I will be president and therefore putting the agenda together, I will arrange the election such that it happens after there is a discussion of the role of the president and the vice president. However, we do need to do some action on the 6th. Otherwise, we go forward with no president or vice president. Further comment, please. I, I want to actually second Alyssa's comment that this is one of the only things we do that is completely an internal council decision, and I, I would strongly okay. suggest we not have public comment on this item. Okay. I agree. All right. We still need to elect a vice president 
between now and... I'm going to come and swear you in for a one-month term. I'm sorry? She does swear you in. Oh, excuse me. Let's do this. I've been acting without that for about a month. Um, all right. Um, I will ask for nominations for the council of the, from the council for the council vice president. Nominations do not require a second. Councilors may nominate themselves. After, after each nomination, I will ask the council nom councilors nominated if they accept the nomination. When there are no further nominations, I will ask each nominee if they would like to make a brief statement. I will then ask the clerk of the council to call the roll call for the vote. Please state at that time either the no name of the nominee and or abstain. At the conclusion of the roll call vote, the clerk of the council will announce the results. The nominee will receive a majority, must receive a majority of votes is deemed elected vice president. If no nominee receives a majority, we will then continue the process. We've been there before. Um, so this is a nomination for a term of vice president to expire January 6th, 2020. Pat. I nominate uh, Councillor Haneke. Are there any other nominations? Okay. Would you like to make a statement? Do you accept? Yes, I do. <laughs> Would you like to make a statement? Um, I'll make a brief one. Um, it's been an honor to serve as vice president for the last year. Um, I hope, despite the election last year, that I've earned your trust um, over the course of the year. And it would be an honor to serve for another three weeks at this point, but um, and so. Take it as it comes. Okay. Um, any further discussion? Then please have the roll call vote. Councillor Brewer. Abstain. Councillor DeAngelis. Haneke. Councillor Dumont. Haneke. President Griesmer? Haneke. Councillor Haneke? Myself, Mandy Jo Haneke. Councillor Pam? Haneke. Councillor Ross? Haneke. Councillor Ryan? Haneke. Councillor Shane? Haneke. Councillor Schreiber? Haneke. Councillor Steinberg? Haneke. Councillor Swartz? Abstain. Councillor Baumilm? Haneke. It's 11 yes and two abstentions. Thank you. We will now proceed. I'm sorry. Oh, she has to be sworn in. Please be sworn in. Then we can zip through the agenda. Yeah, right. All right, let me briefly go to announcements. Uh, the In this room at six o'clock on the 6th, prior to the t regular town council meeting, we will actually have the swearing in of newly elected town officials. That includes people for, for the school committee, whether they've served in the past or not, as well as new members, people for Jones Library trustees, people for the housing authority, and the Oliver Will Trust. Oliver, Oliver Smith, Smith Will Elector. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I want to really quickly look at the order of the agenda. This is done so that, frankly, uh, we want to make sure that those of you that have come for special items have an opportunity to have those earlier in the evening versus later. And so therefore, the order of the agenda is going to be general public comment immediately following this. 
proclamations and commemorations of which we have none. Action items 8A, 8B, and 8C. Those are Community Preservation Act funds for Kendrick Park, the acquisition of Hickory Ridge property, and community choice aggregation. We are then going to move on to the general bylaw reading, which is the first reading. And then we're moving on to the town manager goals, first reading, and then going back to presentations and discussions, and that is the OCA process for recommending candidates for appointments per charter for full town council, by full town council, I'm sorry, including the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Planning Board. And then we'll proceed with the rest of the agenda item as listed. So with that, uh, I'd like to see hands for those people who would like to speak for public comment. Okay, I'd like to start with the gentleman right here. Please come forward and identify yourselves. And are you coming as one or two people? We're coming as two people. Okay, thank you. You're, you're limited individually to three minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is David Slobiter. And I neglected to push the button, but okay. I had help. Thank you. My name is David Sloviter. I live at 194 Lincoln Avenue. I'm joined by Nancy Ratner, who lives at 199 Lincoln Avenue. And I've been asked by a number of neighbors to present to the uh, council and make you aware of a problem that we have. Lincoln Avenue is a direct through route from Amity Street and Route 9 to the UMass campus. It is the only connecting street other than Pleasant Street that has no directional restrictions where it meets Massachusetts Avenue and is popular because it allows drivers and delivery vehicles seeking access to UMass to avoid the lights and traffic on Pleasant Street. As a result, it is one of the busiest streets in Amherst during the work week, especially when UMass is in session. The situation involving non-resident cars parking on Lincoln all day during the work week has become increasingly difficult and dangerous in the past year, and it continues with no indication that it will change. Lincoln Avenue has essentially become a free parking area for UMass during the week. It creates delays, difficulty for residents trying to leave their driveways, and close calls between oncoming vehicles. There have even been events where side mirrors on passing cars have hit each other. It also creates a hazard for cars trying to turn from McClellan onto Lincoln. During the average weekday when the university is in session, cars are parked along Lincoln throughout the day in an almost solid line, beginning at McClellan and extending well beyond Elm. This line of cars forms a gauntlet that interferes with the passage of vehicles. Only two compact cars can pass each other comfortably. Large cars must slow and often pull over and wait. Delivery vehicles such as UPS, FedEx, oil trucks, trash trucks, landscapers, etc., which would be able to flow easily if the line of cars was not there, must wait on the side in front of a driveway before being able to proceed down the gauntlet. The dimensions of Lincoln Avenue allow for two active transit lanes which move freely and efficiently. The dimensions do not allow for two transit lanes and a parking lane. A row of cars removes one third of the street from vehicle movement. The remaining space is not sufficient for free and safe movement. We are interested only in- are, We're starting sorry. with another three minutes? Uh, yes, we are. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Um, I'm Nancy Ratner. I live at 199 Lincoln Avenue. Yes. Uh, and uh, we are interested only in correcting a situation that is inconvenient and annoying at its best and downright dangerous at its worst. We have considered different options, but we feel that the best solution is for there to be no parking on Lincoln Avenue on weekdays between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. This would bring the part of Lincoln where parking is currently legal into conformity with the rest of Lincoln, north of McClellan, where parking is already restricted with those limits. A suggestion was made for a two-hour parking limit, but we feel that it's not workable and would require significant town resources to monitor and enforce. The fire chief agrees that the current situation presents undesirable challenges and supports steps 
and he supports steps that will remove the all-day gauntlet. He said that it would be much easier to get around a single vehicle making a delivery or a landscaper who is parked for a short time than negotiating the current situation. The police chief told us that he does not support a parking ban because he believes that homeowners have a right to park in front of their homes. While we as a community highly approve of the job that Chief Livingstone and the Amherst Police Department do, we respectfully disagree with this one item. We believe that his position is a personal one that does not override our problem. All of the houses on Lincoln Avenue have off-street parking to accommodate a parking ban, and almost every house has signed a petition supporting this request. A restriction during the week from 8 to 5 does not restrict residential or visitor parking on evenings and weekends, nor does it preclude exceptional situations that have always existed, such as a memorial gathering when residents notify the police in advance. We appreciate your consideration, and we ask the council that you change the current Lincoln Avenue parking rules to the restrictions that we propose. And we hope that you feel the same sense of urgency that those of us who live on Lincoln Avenue already feel. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Are, are there other comments? Please come forward. Again, these comments are only on those that are restricted, that are general comments, not the ones identified for other elements of the agenda. OK, thank you. Do I talk in the, uh, do I push, push that? Okay. Make sure the red light is, <laughs> the green light is on. Um, I'm Nancy Gilbert. I live at 166 Lincoln Avenue and I'd like to talk a little bit about this problem. I'd really like clarification on the process on how to address the safety issues on Lincoln. My husband and I went to the November 20th Transportation Advisory Committee because Lincoln Avenue and parking was on the agenda, and it was discussed at that meeting. Two days later, there was a, an article in the Gazette um, in which a council member was, quote, freaking out, unquote, about the process. Having lived on Lincoln Avenue for 34 years, safety has been a, uh, a continuous problem, and it always takes time. Um, at, uh, 34 years ago, speed and the intersection of Lincoln and Fearing was a big issue. We nicknamed that corner of Fearing and, and Lincoln as Crash Corner. Nothing was done for several years until seven accidents occurred in a four-day period after snowstorms when people couldn't see anything at the, uh, because of the high piles of snow at Lincoln and Fearing, and then a four-way stop sign was put in. So, and after 20 years, we finally had speed bumps um, installed, which has helped the speed. But in the past 18 to 24 months, we have this severe problem that's been talked about, where the road is significantly narrowed by parking from, especially from Elm to Amity and from Elm up to McClellan. It's a hazard for two-way traffic. Besides what's been no, uh, mentioned, there's runners from UMass and Amherst College, there's bikers, and I have grandchildren, and it's very dangerous exiting my driveway. So I would really like to know what the action is, or do we have to wait for multiple accidents to happen before something's done? Thank you for your comments. Are there any other comments on Lincoln Ave? Please come forward. So good evening, thank you. I'm Aaron Hayden. I'm the chairman, I'm the chair of the Transportation Advisory Committee. And the issue of Lincoln Avenue was brought to us. I have two apologies to make, first of all. The first one is that when this issue was brought to us, um, our understanding was that there was going to be a public hearing here. Um, and my uh, committee voted to send me to that public hearing to meet you all on the 16th and do what and offered to, what, to do what we could do to help. Um, we haven't had a chance to unvote that. So uh, it's very busy tonight, and I'm taking your time, and I appreciate that. The uh, second apology is that um, I had hoped to uh, send you, I'd hoped you would have a lot of material about our, the Transportation Advisory Committee's ideas on Lincoln Avenue. Uh, most specifically, um, the it was on the, our agenda with the hopes that we could take a decision. Um, there, it, was a, it looked like a reasonable plan, and as with most things in transportation, they do look reasonable at first blush. But we have learned, 
and select boards in the past, specifically about Lincoln Avenue, have learned is that nothing is as simple as it appears at first. Uh, the Transportation Advisory Committee, um, in reviewing our charge, and one of the pieces of material that I don't think got to you because I sent it to um, the town manager very late last week, um, inc is, includes our charge, which it, uh, which also, or in itself, includes parking as one of the things that we were charged with under the old government organization. Um, the the uh, Transportation Advisory Committee wanted to let you know that we are prepared to, and imagine that it's part of our job, to take on this issue, to try to help figure out uh, what can be done on Lincoln Avenue, as among all of the other things that we've taken on. Um, Lincoln Avenue, um, like, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, West Street, like, um, well, at South Amherst and North Amherst, there are many things that are changing, and most of our work involves things that it include some sort of change. It's upset the way things were. Um, Lincoln Avenue in particular, there's a number of big changes the university has been foisting off on us in the last number of years and plans to in the course of next year. Um, what we would offer um, is probably a routine, well I hope would become routine, um, a series of events that would involve collecting the data from the neighbors, you know, what is it that they're seeing, what are their concerns, um, from the various uh, town departments, emergency services, um, from our own research and um, trying to become familiar with best practices along these things. We're not the first place to have these problems. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to offer that and um, hope that we'll see um, this come to us next year. Thank you for your comments and thanks for your service on the TAC. Are there any other comments on Lincoln Avenue? May those people that would like to make other public comment raise your hand, please. Please come forward, maximum three minutes. Everything's ready, Lynn. Thanks for your advice. Uh, Amy Zuckerman, 117 Brittany Manor Drive. Um, Briefly, I have a lot of work stuff here. You can see it later. I've collected lots of book covers. We have a lot of authors in Amherst, including Emily, who are troubled by a man I'm calling the Mad Hacker. Okay, we're calling this presentation, Don't Steal Our Books. All right, this, uh, here's what the story is. I'm looking the urgent need to fund cybercrime training for the Amherst police and any author who sells their books on Amazon.com. It was very easy for someone in this town to hack into my Amazon.com page take over my account and then enter my author's page where he has been changing my profile picture and book covers at least since last February. The person is a subject of an Amherst Police Department investigation that will likely extend to the FBI. Okay, the issue here is basically that the police, they're wonderful, I've been working with detectives, and the FBI do not know things like, such as who knew that I had an Amazon.com author's page? <coughs> who knew that Emily Dickinson has an Amazon.com author's page? There are 933 books that Emily and Robert Frost have in the library of Amherst, and all of them could be endangered by a person who hacks right into an account, changes their pictures, changes uh, book covers. I've been very concerned because people know that I was actually arrested and charged with being a terrorist. Look at this. Can you imagine wearing this dress? This man had the nerve to take this picture, put it on my page, and say, is this not pretty? Well, the New York Daily News took this picture, it wasn't pretty to me. Luckily, the case was dismissed. But what if he turned me into Patty Hearst? Remember Patty Hearst? With Photoshop, he could simply take a gun and put it in my, on my page and post it. This is very urgent. I think that Mr. Bezos, who owns Amazon.com, has $106 billion. I'm suggesting we je invite Jeff to come here because we need cybercrime training in technology, and we need it in the law. So what are the statutes that have these people, this man is possibly violent? Possibly. State and federal statutes for Social Media Privacy Act. Gave me around with your uh, password. They have all this stuff here. There's a wiretapping act. He, he behind those back taped uh, conversation, put it on YouTube. There's been stuff he's done to town meeting members, possibly. So I want to talk to you about having a meeting. I have lots of information here. Uh, Chief Livingston's involved. The FBI had no idea there were Amazon.com pages. 
If you sell a book on Amazon.com, like uh, Steal This Dream, Steal This Book, all of Emily's books, what happens you get a page. But this man hacked into my account and took over my page, and he's been changing the content. So we need money. I think Jeff Bezos has $106 billion. I think Amherst could have $100 million. Why not? Why not? Let's get this man here. He owns Amazon to help this because who found this out by accident? I, I've helped found hidden tech. Got people right here to help us make sure that no one like me is charged with terrorism. So if someone invades my page and sets me up, done. Everything has been taken. I took all the pictures of this. You'll get it later. Thank so you for happened? your comments. Thank you. Please do something. Thanks. Somebody has left their phone up here. Okay. All right. Are there other public comment? Mr. Riddle? Uh, Chris Riddle, uh, 252 Strong Street. I really have a question for the President uh, with regarding to House Bill 2810. Do you want me to talk about that now, or how would you like this to happen? You and I had an email conversation. Um, we need to do that by either email or later. The main thing is that this we don't have dialogue during public comment. Okay, I'll go okay, away. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Ms. McLeod, you had your hand up. Thank you very much. Thank you, good evening. I'm going to read the letter of support from the League of Women Voters. The League of Women Voters of Amherst supports the town's purchase of the 140-acre Hickory Ridge Golf Course as described by Assistant Town Manager David Samak at the District 5 meeting on November 21, 2019. This purchase will provide a significant opportunity for the town to address climate change in the broadest sense, such as planting native trees to provide habitat and absorb carbon dioxide, and restoring Fort River wetlands as well as creating nature trails and recreational opportunities. Solar panels covering 26 acres are part of the proposed agreement with the seller. The League of Women supports is based on both state and local league positions. The League promotes an environment beneficial to life through protection and wise management of natural resources in the public interest. The League supports the management of natural resources to enhance and protect the unique character of the Connecticut River Basin and to protect, maintain, or restore its function as a green belt. In addition, the League of Women Voters of Massachusetts unanimously adopted a climate emergency resolution in June 2019 that strongly urges relevant action at all levels of government for the environment. The League of Women Voters is a non-partisan organization that encourages informed and active participation in government. The League comments on specific topics when these topics are relevant to publish local, state, or national positions. League positions are established only after League members study issues and there is general agreement or consensus among members. Thank you very much. Thank you. There is a copy of that letter yes. in councillors' folders and uh, it pertains particularly to the um, Hickory Ridge mm -hmm. for which we do not have other public comment yes. tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Are there any other public comments at this time? Okay, seeing none, we're going to proceed then to action item 8A, which is regarding Kendrick Park. And the first is to have the Community Vet Preservation Act Committee make their report. Hi, uh, I'm Nate Buddington. I'm chair of the CPA committee. Uh, typically, in the middle of December, the CPA committee is uh, evaluating different proposals that have come from... Uh, before us uh, in preparation to presenting to you a slate of CPA endorsed project sometime in the end of January. And, and we are doing that and we will be producing that slate for you in, in January. 
This particular proposal is a little unorthodox in its timing, and it's why we're asking for an expedited approval. The park grant requires that full funding of this project uh, be approved by a town government by the end of the year, end of the calendar year. So what, basically what we're asking, because currently CPA doesn't really have any money to distribute, that will come in a little while, we're asking for an approval to bond the full 659,000 uh, amount for the playground, 259,000 of which will be the CPA request that we've approved. What will happen is when, when the park grant is received, we won't borrow that 400,000. So we're really, truly only gonna be borrowing the 259,000 CPA portion of this. Uh, but we have to make the formal request because we have no money and the entire amount has to be uh, dedicated by uh, the end of the year. So it's a little bit of a squirrely situation, but does that make sense? Are that? there questions from the council? Yes, Pat. Um, I'm wondering what impact uh, that will have on the dis distribution of CPA funds to other projects. Uh, in other words, we're taking this out of the pile without knowing what the pile is. Well, we won't, what, what it will cost the CPA will be $259,000. That's what will come out of this next year's pot. I guess what I'm asking then is what's the impact of removing 259,000? I think we're about 900,000, do we know? Uh, yeah. Sonia, would you please come forward? But this is a borrowing authorization for the full amount of $659,000. CPA is going to be borrowing as well. So once the project is done, we get the $400,000 for the grant. We end up borrowing two hundred and fifty nine, dollars and there'll be debt service for 10 years. And that'll be about $30,000 a year, $36,000 each year and um, some of the debt has already dropped off we have one debt that dropped off this year that was about 26,000 and for 2021 I believe the Hawthorne property debt which is another 36,000 and that is dropping off so it will pretty much be right where we are thank you that's helpful are there other questions stay right there Sonia thank you <laughs> Ms. Aldridge is our controller our fi interim finance director She's the woman with the answers on finance. Um, are there other questions from the council? Can I, yes. I just uh, wanted to state Dorothy. for those um, watching or listening who are s as slow as I am with numbers, that um, the cost is 659,000. The grant is 400,000. So all we are gonna pay is that 259,000. That's, That's correct. We don't, that 600, forget that. We're not paying that. Correct. That's correct. Yes. Mandy Jo. I might have missed it, but did you state the vote on the CPA committee for the recommendation? It was unanimous. Enthusiastic. Okay. Yes, Andy. Yeah, I was uh, saving my report for later, but I wanted to just pick up on this piece of it um, because it all fits together. Um, as um, it stated in the written report, um, it, it was uh, mentioned by uh, Ms. Aldrich, uh, the payments would be over a period of 10 years for the $259,000 at $30,000 a year, including uh, debt service, and that's an approximate amounts for 10 years. This is actually a very common practice of the Community Preservation Act Committee over the years as and approved um, by town meeting each time it's come up. But there have been numbers of different proposals that have been sufficiently large that the concern was that funding them all at one year in one year time would um, either exceed the amount available for the year or would take um, away the ability to do anything else for that year. And as a consequence, that the wisest financial management approach that has been recommended by the Community Preservation Act Committee over the years has been on larger purchases to bond them and spread the payment 
over a period of time so that each year that there would be amount of money available to um, consider significant proposals in all different areas. Are there other questions from the council? Why don't you just stay right there for a moment. Andy, do you have any further things to comment from the Finance Committee? Um, well, as I stated just a moment ago, in the, fin in the uh, packet for today's meeting is the Finance Committee report of December 16, 2019. And uh, the uh, major item, the second major item discussed in there and at some length is the Kendrick Park proposal. And I'm not going to go through all of that because I, uh, that's why it was provided in advance in writing. Um, the uh, point that was just made about how the Community Preservation Act Committee was, uh, um, normally operates was actually going to be part of my comments, so fit right in and I don't have to repeat that either. Uh, which then gets us to uh, the last piece is that what you should really be looking at also um, that was provided in the packet for today's meeting is financial order 20-45 because that's actually what you're going to be voting on. That is going to be um, in, in, in effect the motion that's on the floor. And after the whereas sections, there are three subsections to it. And just want to um, say that those are all um, requirements of the grant, as Mr. Zomek will explain if there are questions about it. The first one is to transfer care, custody, and control of Kendrick Park um, to the, from, from its current management under the town manager to the LSSC Commission. That is a grant requirement of the park grants to assure that uh, the park remain as a park and be under the control of um, the body in town that is uh, going to be managing, uh, that, that manages that kind of property so that the use continues. Um, if that was not included, we would not qualify for the grant. Uh, the second part is to borrow the $659,000 and to authorize the um, issuance of bonds and notes for payment of that. Um, I won't get into the whole distinction between notes and bonds and when each will be issued. Um, if uh, anybody really wants to get in, dig into that minutia, um, they, we can respond to questions either myself or Ms. Aldrich. And the third part is um, to authorize the town manager and, and or the LSSC commission um, or their designees to apply for and accept um, grants, including the park grant and any other grants that might be available uh, to assist in this particular project. So when you vote, you will be voting on the order, and those are the three action items in the order. I think and um, the vote of the that, nothing else I need to say. The vote of the finance committee was uh, four to zero with one member absent. Okay. Are there any other questions from the council at this time? Okay. Yes. I'm Alyssa? sorry. When we are saying questions, are we saying questions of these people, questions, questions of the finance committee, questions of the entire project? Are there any other okay. questions in general from the town council at this time? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so um, clarifying that Again, there was an earlier position given by representing LSSC, but what, and then it was mentioned LSSC Commission. Those, of course, being two completely separate entities. LSSC is town staff. The LSSC Commission is appointed by the town manager and works with staff. And in this case, verifying that, in fact, LSSC Commission is the body, rather than just saying the town manager and his employees, LSSC Commission also has a role in here, as they traditionally do with other, with other park items. But just clarifying that those are two different things. The other question I'm having a hard time grasping here is it makes me very nervous in our financial situation that we are in right now talking about capital projects to say it's only $200,000. $400,000 is coming from the state. Why worry? Um, I'm not seeing 
and I'm having a hard time understanding what we're buying for over $600,000 for this playground setup that we, again, have been shown a preliminary plan. I understand that there's the attention to at least talk about it once more on January 9th. But $600,000 for some paving, some benches, and a couple of pieces of playground equipment, I grant you that when I worked on developing the Mill River Playground a couple decades ago, things obviously didn't cost that. But if someone could explain, give us context of there's a problem with the site development or we have to put up fences and because no one's ever shown us fences, um, I would understand better why we were spending 600000 on this, which granted is $400,000 of all of our money, just not our direct tax money here. Mr. Zomack. So it's a very good question, and we have, we have context for this. So the town has, in the last couple of years, uh, embarked on two playground projects. One was at Crocker Farm School, and the other one is in process right now at Groff Park. And I'm afraid the, the straightforward answer is that these things are expensive. Um, everything must be, and of course we will, uh, we want everything to be accessible. So we will have, new, as, as was shown in the preliminary design, we will have new sidewalks, which will make a portion of Kendrick Park accessible to anyone. We will have accessible benches. We will have many of the playground uh, structures will be accessible. And we're also required now, the days of wood chips and sand under these structures are long gone. The state will not pay for those, and frankly, we shouldn't be using those surfaces we will use a rubberized surface that is both safe and accessible. So when you combine new sidewalks, uh, structures, benches, uh, shade structures potentially, all the design and that construction, um, 650,000 is about right. And so what we did was we got cost estimates, we work with Berkshire Design, we got cost estimates for all of that. And then we, we also have good working relationships with the vendors who provide the play structures. So we even went out and said, if we were to pick this, 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 and this in this uh, area with, with the following square footage, give us a ballpark as to where we would be. And that's where Nate Malloy, who's our senior planner and his was uh, very, uh, worked very closely with Becky Demling, who's behind me in the Crocker Farm team on their playground and Nate also worked on Crocker Farm with DPW and LSSC. So um, we're getting pretty good at this, and that's where the estimate came from. Further questions? Yes, Dorothy. I read through the community comment that was included amongst the many materials for this meeting, and one of them said, try to make it as natural as possible using um, gla uh, grass and stone walls. I thought that was very nice. But it also mentioned something I brought up earlier in some committee meeting um, about a public restroom. And it said, and I agree, not to have a public restroom there is not to serve the people well who are there. And, um, and if I were there with a small child who needed a bathroom, I'm going to go cross the street and try to find some small store that's still open and available and wants public to come in and use their restroom, I think that's a real challenge. I mean, I know there's a huge problem in policing public restrooms, but I think that a triangle park sitting in the middle of roads has to have its own restroom. Okay. Additional comments from the council? Yes, Dorothy. I, I'm sorry. That, that's, that's all right. I'll, I'll answer too. Kathy. Anything. Um, you know, I just, it's a comment I made on finance too, but on this idea of natural, I also think we're, we should be worried about the maintenance of it and keeping it up. And what I mentioned during um, the finance committee meeting is I recently walked on the Amherst grounds behind some of the beautiful new buildings they built, their outdoor structure. They're using our, uh, we're a glacier valley and they put some, brought in some really big rocks that they created seats out of them that I think will probably be extremely low maintenance over time as seating places because they're rocks and they're gorgeous. So, so rather than 
traditional benches and other place to sit. It's also a beautiful way to do this that will be lower on long-term costs and not have to bring in a lot of wood and other structures that aren't native to us. Um, so just thinking in terms of not traditionally just go buying it, some, there's some pretty creative things that are, are happening around town that we could get some good ideas, a sustainable park playground, not just um, uh, the, quick, the quicker one where you can buy all the pieces. Yes, David. So these are all great qu comments, and we've heard many of them through the last couple of years, certainly about kind of a naturalized features of the, of the, of the park, of the playground. Um, at Guelph Park, for instance, we, uh, we used uh, stone to, as a, both a retaining wall, but also as a sitting space. So it's about two and a half, three feet off the ground, so that'll be a great place for children and families to put their towels when they're in the, when they're in the uh, uh, spray park. Um, I do wanna say that um, rocks are never the perfect substitute when you're yeah. talking ADA, so we need to have both. Uh, I really um, need to mic. So all of this, and I encourage all of you and anyone watching at home or behind me in the audience here, um, we, through working with LSSC, having the DPW and planning all around the table in January and February um, with these design charrettes, um, we're going to be needing to move this quickly because we need to have a design in a, in a couple of months um, if this moves forward, but we, will, we encourage all of these kinds of comments. I will say that the restroom comment, we've heard that one in many times in the planning department. I've talked with the town manager. I think that's part of a bigger discussion about downtown and what we can offer children, families, and visitors. I will, just to put a number on it, if you wanted to add a bathroom, which is not part of this proposal, you're probably north of $200,000 additional uh, to the 650. So it's, it's, it's not part of this project. Um, it's part of a larger conversation about our downtown. Thank you. Additional questions, comments from the council? Sarah. So I, I, I appreciate this project, and I, I definitely think a lot of people have put a lot of time into it. Um, I will say I'm just going to echo the fact that I realize that a grant is for a large part of it, but I still think there's a great deal of money that CPA, which is still our taxes, are going into it. And I went to three of the four listening sessions, and I heard a lot of people saying, we have these capital projects. I don't even think there's just four. I think there's actually six. Like, you have to put sidewalks in there. And um, another thing that's come up for us a lot is maintenance. And I feel like what I heard from a lot of people was they love being here. They want the vibrancy. But they're, they're Definitely, there is excitement about the four um, capital projects, but people really urged all of us to really think about what our, our needs and what our wants and to be really careful about what we spent. Um, and so I myself will vote no on this, but I, I'm doing it because I feel like um, I'm listening to the people um, that I'm representing and um, it's not disrespectful to the work that's been done here. Nate. If I could just speak to that. Um, I think as a CPA member, I would, I would hope that, and, and I, I fully grasp your sensitivity to the upcoming huge expenses we're going to entail for some of these projects, and also a general sensitivity to taxpayers. Uh, the CPA money is a direct surtax right off of people's property taxes. We're very sensitive to that in CPA, and I think that's why we in the three years that I've been on the committee have been pretty conservative. I think we have not hesitated to turn projects down that we didn't think were particularly well supported or particularly valid or necessary or served a wide swath of the population. But I would hope that we could separate the CPA funds from uh, these larger capital projects because they are, you know, they're really dedicated funds for these types of projects that sometimes are very hard to find money for. And they're not huge, they're not often not fancy, but they really allow us to bring in these resources from the property tax surcharge, or surtax, um, and really fund things that are really hard to find monies for, historical preservation and recreation. Um, so I, I, 
I understand there's an overwhelming and un, un, completely understandable sensitivity to spending money in town, um, but, but, but I hope we couldn't, we avoid kind of confusing these CPA dollars with some of these projects, because I think they're, they're really different animals. Alyssa. So I, I just want to make clear the two, all the people have worked on this, it's great, and you haven't convinced me. So I'm seeing an incredibly unattractive blue and red play structure that I would love next at Groff or at Mill River or someplace else, not in the middle of my downtown park. And for people to say, well, you know, you can come to a meeting and maybe have some more input on that. We've been talking about natural features for a long time. There's been no indication that's actually going to change. There's been no discussion of fencing and why it's important or not important because state of the art says we don't need it in, based on the fact that it's in between all these busy roads, but explain to us why we don't need it. We have an incredibly vague budget that has no indication of what pricing is for equipment. We have no final say on design here at town council. There's been no discussion around the fact that, at town council, around the fact that it's possibly, quite possibly been discussed at leisure services commission meetings and elsewhere, that when we have students pouring out of the spoke at two in the morning, they're going to use the playground equipment because of course you would if you were 20 and it was two o'clock in the morning at the spoke. And there's been no discussion that there's any sensitivity to that. And it's not my job to come to your meetings to find out that you've discussed that. I feel like it's your job to have told me already that that's there and none of that is here. So that is why I'm inviting no. Um, please come forward from the LSSC Commission. Hi, um, Rebecca Demling, LSSC Commission. Um, Hi, Rebecca Demling, LSSC Commission. Um, so I will say that those are things we actually have discussed at our LSSC public forum. Um, we talked about making it less appealing to college students. Um, but what we heard a lot of is Amherst playgrounds are fairly run down, um, much like many of our, our uh, buildings, quite frankly, and fields. Um, I've worked on three different playgrounds in the last 10 years in town. They are really expensive to build handicap accessible. To get the type of playground that will serve young families, that will entice them to come downtown and play downtown, I think it's an investment in our downtown. And I know this project is moving quickly, and we don't have a lot of answers yet, frankly, because we haven't hosted more public forums yet, which are starting January 9th. I am sure LSSC Commission would be happy to come before town council and give regular updates about this project. But frankly, <coughs> the closest playground to downtown is War Memorial. That playground is older than my, you know, it is ridiculously old, not up to code, not accessible. We keep talking about making Amherst a welcoming, accessible community. Part of that is having play spaces for families. And it's far more environmentally friendly to have a playground where people can go and socialize than it is for people to keep building plastic things in their backyards. So if we want to really consider making Amherst open and accessible. We need to make it open and accessible to families. We need to support our downtown businesses by bringing reasons for people to come downtown because that contributes to our tax base. And we also need to start tackling delayed investment in things that matter to quality of life. Thank you. Other comments from the council? Yes, Mandy Jo. So, uh, Becky got to it before I did, but um, I, I echo everything she said. We as a council have talked about the flight of families from this town. How can we bring families back to this town? When on Lincoln Avenue, you cannot walk to a playground, you might not buy a house on Lincoln Avenue. When on Blue Hills, you can't walk to a playground. When you can't safely bike to a playground because it's down at Groff Park, down 116, which is what I did with my child very unsafely for years when I lived in downtown. You don't want to live downtown. 
we're trying to put a playground in downtown to bring families back into town, which is what I thought we wanted to do in this town. Um, to talk about the CPA funds, they're restricted to four things, housing, recreation, conservation, and historic preservation. We talked on this committee, this council last year about using those funds to maximize the benefit to all of the taxpayers because it is taxpayer funds to try and look for projects that go to benefit everyone in town. This is a project that does this. This is not a project, and, and not to pick on projects or anything, but this is not something like, and, and you can argue it does benefit everyone in town, but the, the window in downtown. The, at the UU that many people argue it is more of a private project that doesn't really benefit all the taxpayers. This is a public playground using taxpayer money that is dedicated for things like recreation. It makes sense to me, and if we want to attract families, this is what we should be doing, and these are the funds we should be using to do it. Andy. Yeah, now I'm going to speak personally and not speak as, on behalf of the Finance Committee. Uh, playgrounds I've become to very much appreciate by having grandchildren and being able to take your grandchild to a playground that is um, safe and inviting um, and accessible is really an important piece of growing up. And we want to make healthy adults out of our young children and we have to provide both the programs and the facilities to make that happen. Um, playgrounds are very different from when um, I took my children, who are now the parents, to playgrounds. There's much more conscientiousness about the whole question of the safety of the equipment and the material that the equipment is made of, in addition to the fact that Dave talked about the surface. And um, all of that does drive the cost of the playground, and, um, but I think that it all is of a single piece. And um, that's why, uh, um, as a single counselor, I'm very supportive of this. I think that it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do for our downtown. Uh, the Business Improvement District was very supportive of it because they felt it was important to bring people to downtown with their families and give them a variety of opportunities so that the bid support of it, I think, is something that we should be thinking about. Um, and I think for our uh, valuing of children, families, uh, this is the right thing to do. Additional comments from the council? Shalini. I echo every, everything that was just re said, very important for a downtown and for families. I just have one concern that was uh, brought to me by a resident about the use of rubber. And I don't know if this is the right forum, but there is uh, rubber that has lead in it, and I'm just concerned and, and wonder if you know what kind of rubber is being used, because there's a particular rubber, it's called, I think, crumb rubber that's used a lot in playgrounds and that has toxic materials in it. Davis. So we are very aware of that issue. And um, again, the park hasn't been designed, so we don't know what rubberized structure we will use. Um, we may be, you know, we're many months away, perhaps a year away from actually constructing anything. So we will do our research with the LSSC Commission, with DPW and planning, to make sure we buy the safest um, material possible at that time. But again, nothing has been designed. We don't even know how many square feet of rubberized surface we're going to need. Um, but we, we are aware of that. It's been brought to our attention through other venues and other, uh, other sources. So we will take that strongly under consideration. Are there other comments from the council at this time? Okay, so um, according to rule 9.3 of our town um, rules of procedure, um, the motion will require a two-thirds vote. That's nine votes because it's an appropriation. Uh, be, we, we, we do not need to suspend the rules, at least in my opinion, and I'm more than glad to have someone challenge that, uh, because if we don't vote on this, we jeopardize 
the possibility of receiving the grant. So it is under 9.3 a legitimate item to go forward on without having to come before two council meetings. Okay. Any question? Andy. I think the clarification that I just made um, is that if this did not require borrowing, I think it would be a majority vote, but because it involves borrowing. Thank you. Okay. So um, the motion, which is on your sheet, I need this motion, is to appropriate to in term no move in terms of council order number 20-45 an order authorizing the dedication of Kendrick Park for park and active recreation purposes and appropriate funds for the rehabilitation and preservation thereof as presented and that item is the fifth item in your motion sheet and it begins with order it has titled Kendrick Park, begins with order 20-45, and Mr. Steinberg referred to that earlier and goes on to the next page. Is there a motion? So Ka moved. Kathy. I move to approve. Is there a second? Dorothy? I second that motion. Is there further discussion? Okay. Uh, since we need to do a two-thirds vote, should we do roll call? Yes. Okay. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Councillor Dumont? Yes. Councillor Griesmer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ross? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Swartz? No. Councillor Balmilne? Yes. Councillor Brewer? No. That's 11 yes and two no. And so the motion passes. Thank you. David, don't go far because we're going to move right on to um, Hickory Ridge. Hickory Ridge has come before this council on many occasions, including it has come before the public at a public forum that was held on September 23rd, 2019. Um, there is no specific comment on this tonight, and uh, we will just uh, start with a Community Preservation Act report. Any further comment on that? You've already been, you've already, we've already. I, I wasn't really prepared to do that, so I'll, yes. if I can just. Um, yeah. That was appropriated already, correct? Okay, thank you. Um, we did that in uh, June of 2019. Sonia, can you just remind us? Correct. Um, during the regular um, CPA process, you voted 200000 to be set aside for this purchase when it came through. Okay. So it's a funding source right now. Okay. Uh, any further co comment from the Finance Committee at this point? I think that uh, the only thing that I'd point out is that in this report, there's reference to the fact that it was the October uh, report to the um, Council that um, was where we took action on this and uh, had substantial discussion. So that there's a, um, a big report in the uh, October 21st Finance Committee report, which I asked to be placed back in the packet for this particular uh, meeting so that it would be before you along with the finance or financial order. Uh, the uh, report goes into some detail about um, our uh, uh, vote and uh, how we came about to that vote and uh, I don't have it in front of me but my recollection is it was, it was three with one abstention three in favor one abstention and one member absent and the um, reasons for the uh, person for Councillor Shane's abstention were um, listed in that report very explicitly stated okay are there other, 
do you want to give us just a brief um, overview? Sure. Please. I, I also wanted to bring to, you, to the council's attention that there is a member of the Conservation Commission who was not able to be at the public forum who may want to say something if, if the council okay. had time. Thank um, you. Why don't you start with your report and then we'll have the member from the Conservation Commission come forward. Sure. I think, as, as has been stated, um, Hickory Ridge has been discussed at a number of public meetings, uh, uh, district meetings. I've been to a number of meetings that I've been invited to to speak on, on the uh, topic. In fact, a number of people have come to me and said, you know, congratulations, when can we start planning for Hickory Ridge? And I have to uh, really put the brakes on that and say that actually, you know, you and, and there are, the town council has not voted on the funding, and there are a number of other steps that we still need to go forward uh, with if, if the town decides to move in that direction. But I think there is high enthusiasm for the plan that Jeff Kravitz and I put forth to you and to the CPA committee, to the finance committee, to the conservation commission. I think um, what I have said in all the public meetings where I've talked about Hickory Ridge it th is that this is really an interdisciplinary project. It is not a 100% um, conservation project, although the CPA committee recommended to you and you you authorize the, um, the spending of $200,000 as part of the package toward uh, conserving uh, uh, the main portion of the property. Um, Mr. Gravitz and I have looked and continue to look actively at some of those parts of the property that are developable and could be reused for other uh, town-related purposes, whether that be affordable housing, whether that be market rate housing, or whether it might mean flipping that or selling that land as surplus property to try to make uh, back all or most of the outlay of the funds uh, that uh, could be expended on the property. We've also had lots of po uh, positive comments about connecting uh, the various housing complexes to the north off of East Hadley Road uh, through and to this property, this beautiful 150-acre property. Um, so that continues to be a reoccurring theme. Um, many people have approached me in these meetings and, and on the street asking also about things like, could we do community gardens adjacent to um, those, um, those residents who live north of the, of the course? And I think all of that would come out in a master planning process. Um, finally, I will say that um, our discussions with the owner continue to be positive. I informed him and his um, company uh, that, that I would be speaking with you tonight. Uh, they are still proceeding with solar on the property, 25 acres of solar. They are, um, have been accepted into the SMART program. They're actually on the waiting list for the SMART program. Um, so they are awaiting word from the state as to what their tax credits for that solar would look like. So I think this is a logical next step for you to consider the, the, the purchase tonight. Again, we would continue to do our due diligence, including um, looking at any um, uh, 21E issues. Uh, that, that has come up at a number of meetings as well. People want to make sure if we do proceed with this, that it's a clean and uh, healthy site. So we're doing that due diligence now. Um, that's just part of uh, any uh, land transaction. Um, so we're, we're, that is an ongoing step we're taking. So okay. I think right now it's, it's a waiting game and, and I, I welcome your questions. Okay, let's have the young woman from the Conservation Commission come forward. Hi. So, hi, my name is Anna devlin Gothier. I'm a member of the Conservation Commission and just wanted to echo our support for this project. The opportunity to conserve this land would be hugely beneficial to the town of Amherst, especially for those in the apartment complexes that directly, that are right near this. It provides opportunities for access to land without needing to get yourself anywhere. So yeah, really echoing Conservation Commission support for this project and um, enthusiasm for conserving much of the land at Hickory Ridge. Okay, thank you. Are there questions from the council? Yes, Dorothy. So this is for Mr. Zomek. Uh, last time we talked about this, they had not gotten on the waiting list for the solar, isn't that right? And you said that we, we couldn't go ahead on something until that was settled. So being on the waiting list, does that mean it's, they're definitely going to be accepted or that, is, or that it's a go in terms of their having, going forward with their um, solar panel project? 
Um, first off, I'm not an expert on the SMART program, the SMART Energy program. Um, but my understanding is that they will eventually get essentially an offer. There are blocks of tax credits. And so depending on what block of those tax credits they get accepted into, that will, uh, as part of their pro forma budget, they will look at all of their sources of revenue, solar, the town of Amherst, any other sources of revenue they have, and they will decide uh, whether they want to move forward with the town of Amherst if you vote for the funding package mm -hmm. before you and with the SMART program. So for, for the town to be in the best position, it would be beneficial for us to come to them with a vote to say, um, we have the funding, we have voted the funding as a town. Uh, the deal is, all the, the conditions of the deal are set in the purchase and sale agreement. The purchase price, uh, any of the due diligence we have to do is all set. Um, now it's a waiting game to see what kicks out for them in the SMART program. And that could be March or April of 2020. But without them knowing what, if we want to play uh, in this equation, um, it leaves them kind of with this big unknown saying, well, we heard from the SMART program March 1st, but we don't know what the town of Amherst wants to do. Um, now, I will say, to be, to be frank, if the, the SMART program um, block is not favorable to them, the possibility exists that they come back to the town and say, thank you very much, town. You've negotiated in good faith, but we can't sell the property uh, for the package that has been presented to us both by the town and through the SMART program. If that were the case, then Hickory Ridge might go on the, you know, up for sale. But to put us in the best position to move forward, that's why we're here tonight. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Uh, Chalini. It's more of a comment. Um, Darcy and I had a District 5 meeting where we invited Dave and Brian Yellen from Fort River Watershed Association. And just want to say, I'm not saying by any ways this was a representative meeting of District 5 people, but we had a you know, few people there and 30 or 4, 40 pe 30 people maybe, 40, 50, 50 people, okay. And there was a, a real support for this project and the potential for it and there's great excitement about it. Hold on, Kathy. Um, this is a comment I made, in, and you can see it in the report that we came from finance, that this does seem, it does to many people feel like a huge bargain price, as this slide says, but the other part of the parcel is that only a small part of it is developable, that's where it's not the 25 acres. So um, on the open market, people would have found, oh, you can't build there, this is rare species, this is wetland. But So one of the things that I think is important because we're $200,000 is coming from uh, CPA, but 420 is coming from the town, and there's another 100,000 that's there for legal fees and for maintenance, so it's 420, and, it's come, and big chunk is coming out of the stabilization fund. So I think it's really important, and we, when we talk about town manager goals, that we move quickly with what are we thinking about those six to seven developable acres, because potentially, if depending on what we decide to do with them, we could make back a large amount of our money. So it would be a really good investment because we would have all the conservation land and that, that small stretch of land along Pomeroy and not leaving the golf club clubhouse to fall apart unused, but thinking about using it. So sooner rather than later, rather than a uh, long planning process that two or three years from now uh, zero in on it. And we received at least one public comment during finance about a concern of pulling money out of stabilization fund, knowing the other needs that could draw on that. So trying to think of how do we, are there ways we recoup some of that while getting everything else we wanted sooner rather than later. So that was really the only abstention was uh, trying to, my assumption was not that I didn't like this project, but wanting to recoup some of that money. Yes. 
Um, just to clarify numbers, if I could. Um, so 200 from CPA, 114 from the sale of real estate account, which can only be used to go back into buying real estate for the town, and then 306. I think you may have you might have added. I, 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 well, I lumped 114 yeah. in because I think if it yeah. is real money, we could have bought yeah. something else. Oh, yeah. So Absolutely. it's just we're we're choosing to buy this. Yes. So if we think of even the property is zoned um, outlying residential. So if we think of five or six house lots at a going house lot rate in Amherst, um, we not to say that that is our preferred option to move forward with the frontage. But right there is a significant amount of uh, recaptured funds. Um, if an average house lot in Amherst, say, is 100,000 plus, so five to six house lots, um, and, and that's just one option for reuse of the frontage. Okay. Yes, Pat. Um, this is a project that I've been interested in since uh, the council started, um, and I think Particularly, I am supportive of the community gardens for East Hadley Road uh, residents. However, I have some questions because I've sort of develop, developed a skeptical kind of tension about the project. Um, it's a, been a golf course, so that means the greens, the grounds have been maintained uh, with what kind of chemicals or pesticides because that would impact the gardening. That's one question. Uh, another question is, there is uh, flooding in the, in the uh, area, and I've seen pictures of it, um, and I'm concerned about what impact that would have on trails and access out through it. Um, and the third part of my concern is an ongoing maintenance cost, which we're estimated, and I understand they're an estimate, of $100,000 a year. That's one firefighter, and we are having a hell of a time um, staffing our fire department. And we need to look at that as a town. So I'm sitting here with these three things, so I, if you could address them in any way for me. Can I try one? Can I give it a shot? Sure. All right. Yeah. So um, I want to talk specifically about the trail one. I drove past it today. If anyone else did, we, we got some water going on. Um, so the this will, I believe, be part of the open spaces plan as well in terms of when we think about trail maintenance. That is something um, the commission this year has been meeting. Admittedly, I'm the only one who has not met with Dave yet, but <laughs> we've all been meeting with Dave to think about specifically which areas of the commission we want to focus on. And so trail maintenance, trail upkeep is something that we're going to be taking very seriously under consideration um, and looking at the data that we have, looking at photos that we have to consider what might flood and how we can mitigate. The, it's going to be taken under consideration, whether through bridges, through other modes. Um, we're not trying to build something that's going to get wrecked every year. That's not, that's not efficient. That's not helpful. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> David Bazur, <Thanks. laughs> anything we know about the use of chemicals? Sure. Let me just add one thing to the trails. So we have trails that flood all over town. This property, if we buy it, is no different. Uh, the one difference is that the, I think there are four bridges. Um, those bridges, as far as I know, have been there for years. Uh, one of them is planned to be used for the solar installation, so it is a very solid bridge. So even when it floods, as it is right now, when the floodwaters recede, those bridges pop out from under the water. They're metal, um, and they're really hardy bridges. So um, there will be times of the year when the trails are inaccessible, but that's true of all of our trails, or many of our trails. Yes, at so, this Brook Cup. So no worry there. Um, and we'll just work with nature. And, um, yeah, and that, sorry, that water is also really helpful for the ecosystems that live there, right? So there's, it's not necessarily something we're going to try to change, I would imagine, because we want to continue that, that ecosystem that's thriving there. So that speaks to your first question about pesticides and herbicides. And to be honest, um, we would have to test the soil there. But again, um, with that water comes, um, you know, a certain amount of cleansing and moving of those materials. So Although it, it'll be part of our master planning process, we will take a look at those soils. Um, the good news, I guess, to say there is that um, Amherst was most, mostly orchards, or a lot of Amherst was orchards. And in fact, I'd be more worried if this property had been an orchard than 50 years of a golf course. 
um, because those or the chemicals that we historically used on orchards um, stay there for a long, long time in the soil. So we will be testing the soil in those areas where, where we propose um, gardens. And your last was ongoing maintenance. I think the $100,000 really was for a complete package of due diligence, looking at the building, looking at the building systems, um, uh, doing any kind of uh, remediation that we have to do. I don't think the annual maintenance of the property will be $100,000. That is something we would work out in the future, uh, but it'll be significantly less on an annual basis than $100,000. Mandy Joe. So we've been talking about how to get potentially the money we're potentially appropriating tonight back. And I look at we're pulling money from two sources beyond the CPA, existing from, from the sale of real estate account, and then I think it's our stabilization fund. Um, if we sell the land, the buildable land, which account does it go back into? Does it go back into the stabilization because we borrowed from that, or does it go into the sale of real estate where the only thing we can use it for is to buy more real estate? Thank you, It'll Simone. go back into the sale of real estate account. However, you can use that towards um, building projects, too, when we have those coming up. So you can use it. Without be, having to buy a land. We would be able to use it yes. for some of the capital projects? Yes, then? I just did some research with the DOR on that, and you can. Okay. Thank you for that question and the answer. Additional questions from the council? Dorothy. I just want to make a comment. <clears throat> when you're talking about how wet it was, uh, I lived in <clears throat> uh, Windsor, Connecticut for a while, and the fields across the street, I was able to go and look for pollywogs. And you know, so many things change and so many things that we used to do disappear. This sounds like a place where you could find pollywogs. Are there other comments from the council? Evan. Yeah, I just want to echo some of the statements that were made when this project was first introduced to us. Uh, the watershed scientist in me was very excited about the opportunity to conserve the stretch of river and, um, and allow it to flood, um, which is great. Um, and then I realized that as an elected official, I also have a fiduciary responsibility, and I got really sad about that um, because I thought I've been trying to be very guarded about our use of the stabilization fund, and I've voted against things in the past that I might agree with on an ideological level because I want to protect that stabilization fund. Um, and I think what's, what's allowing me to vote for this project are two things. Uh, one are the estimates that we have uh, been presented about um, the pilot payments and the potential to actually uh, receive more in pilot payments than we had in property taxes, um, which will help us recoup some of that money. Um, and then the other thing is what Kathy and, and Mandy Joe referenced, which is the ability perhaps to sell off some of this land. And so my hope is that um, my vote for this project uh, also indicates uh, uh, an expectation that there will be some attempts to try to recoup some, some of the costs on this project so that we can have both. Okay, are there other comments or questions? Okay, then the motion uh, before you, we do not need to suspend rule 8.4. This has come before the council on numerous occasions unless somebody wants to challenge that. Okay. Then the motion is in terms of Council Order 20-26, an order authorizing the acquisition of Hickory Ridge property as presented. And that item appears as the last two pages of your motion document. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Shalini is the motion to second? Second. Andy's the second. It requires a two-thirds vote, and we will do a roll call vote. You don't think it requires two thirds? Yeah, it, it, because we're acquiring property, um, right? It, it requires two thirds. And, okay. I'm I'm sorry. I was looking for a, I was looking to hear the second. Who and stabilization, and to take money out of stabilization requires two thirds. If we um, recoup enough money and have money to put back into reserves. It goes into free cash, or we can vote by majority vote to put it into stabilization at that time, but it requires two-thirds to take it out. 
Okay. You were looking for who was the second? Who was the second? Andy. Andy. I got it. Thank you. Councillor Dumont? Yes. Uh, Councillor Griesmer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ross? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Swartz? No. Councillor Baumilne? Yes. Councillor Brewer? Yes. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. That's 12 yes and one no. Thank you. We're going to take a five minute break. Thank you. Okay, we're going to reconvene and uh, we are now moving to agenda item 8C, Community Choice Aggregation. Um, we have a committee report. We have a council discussion. We have public comment on this, and then we'll see where we go from there. Okay. Thank you. S Stephanie. Thank you. Um, good evening. I'm Stephanie Ciccarello, Sustainability Coordinator for the Town of Amherst, and also a member of the Intermunicipal Community Choice Aggregation Task Force. And I'm joined uh, this evening by Stan Schwartz, who is also um, a CCA Task Force member and also um, a representative of the town of Pelham, who will be joining me in this presentation. So in the interest of time, <laughs> which is going along quite slowly, there's, um, <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's uh, you know, quite a bit to discuss, and we don't want to focus on what community choice aggregation is, because each of you has already met with individual task force members. Also, we've done outreach to the public. We, there have been several um, house gatherings and also a few larger events in public forums. So we feel like tonight we want to more focus on the actual process of what brought us here to you this evening. So um, how we came together was that we were approached by um, Actually, Mayor David Narkowitz contacted um, municipal leadership to see if we were interested in having a meeting after their having been approached by the Western Mass Community Choice Aggregation Advocacy Group. And so we met in Northampton with members. Um, it was community leaders. It was uh, leadership staff and community um, activists from Northampton, Amherst, and Pelham who convened at that meeting. And as a result, we formed this community choice intermunicipal aggregation effort. And so for the past 18 months, we've been looking and investigating what the feasibility would be of creating an intermunicipal community choice aggregation, which is similar to what's referred to as the California model. Um, so for 18 months, we've conducted extensive research and we've worked with two industry expert consultants um, basically to identify two things. One is if creating such an entity was feasible, and then two, to make a right recommendation as to whether or not our communities should move forth with this effort. The summary report, an executive summary in your packets, um, provides the information of that process in far more detail. Both Northampton and Pelham have received authorization to move forward with developing a plan to create a municipal aggregation. So we are looking this evening for Amherst to do the same. Our state legislators have secured funding for um, development of a business plan, so to assist with development of a business plan for Amherst and Pelham. And we're seeking this authorization to move forward so that we create a plan that would be both meeting the DPU, Department of Public Utilities, statutory requirement, but it's also the first step in the formation of a municipal aggregation. Um, and another reason that we are also seeking this authorization is that it's needed to access the funding which our state legislators have secured for us, and that funding is only available until June 30th of this year. Also, more importantly, this aligns with the adopted goals that the council approved most recently for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So we feel that this effort is a vital step in that process. And with that, I will turn this over to my colleague, Stan Schwartz. 
Thank you for letting me speak you to you. I have to hold it down. Oh, I have to hold it down. Okay. There it is. Okay. Just have to convince it. Okay. Um, so, yes, we are here basically to take what is the first legal step in this process. It is required by the uh, municipal aggregation statute that uh, each legislative body authorize the development of a plan. That's really what you're authorizing today. Simply the development of a plan which then goes to the Department of Public Utilities. But we can't submit it unless we, we have this authorization. And so again, this is the beginning of a process, not the end of the process. Yeah. And I know we've, one of our members has spoken with each of you, but I, that was a while ago, so I'll just uh, hit a couple of the highlights here. This, the law states that this is an opt-out program, so that once it starts, uh, residents have the opportunity to opt out, but if they don't act, then they're automatically in. Okay. Our goal, in fact, it was stated at our first meeting of the task force, our ult primary goal is greenhouse gas emission reductions. Okay. And we see this as a valuable tool for that purpose. And also the law requires that the plan be available for public review. Um, normally in towns that um, do municipal aggregation, that's a pretty limited process. But to do the type of aggregation that we are envisioning, we need public support and we need public engagement. And so we are planning to do extensive public outreach and ongoing public outreach. Because it's not something that some people in the back office are doing, it's something that the community has to be involved in. And basically, that's about it except for questions. Now, I believe you've got the uh, motion in front of you. Yeah. We do. Okay. Thank you. Council, we're open for questions. Yes. Okay, I had a couple questions uh, that are um, in two categories. The first is, as I read through what I thought was an excellent report. I mean, I, I just really liked it because you gave a lot of examples on what Cape Cod and others were doing, and then you could read to the end and see the resolutions. This initial process, as I understand it, um, then once we do, if we, do, we go ahead with the authorization, is there some costs involved to getting to the proposal that goes to the state with legal advice coming up with some plan design? So my first question is, is the amount, the $50,000 enough to basically cover that cost? It will probably cover the cost of developing the plan Submitting the plan to DPU will probably uh, require additional funding, which we are looking for. We're hoping to find additional funding outside of municipal funds, but we may be back. Okay, because that was, th you anticipated, so if that's not enough, or if that's, well, that wouldn't be necessarily enough for the next, next steps, right. which are kind of trying to set this up and do some of it. So the, just, uh, a few, just say a few words on, is there outside funding once it's up and running, as I read it, the fees that will be charged will be covering the operating costs to the extent they are, you know, right. what they are, but this initial investment on the front end, there are funds out there that you think you should, can secure? We can look for them, but the other possibility is the fees that we will, can collect on the, once it's up and running, we can use to pay back loans. So if com communities are willing to loan us the startup f funds, then we can pay it back in the first year or two from operating cost, or operating revenue. I, I would like to also add that in addition to the 50,000 that we've secured from the state legislators, um, we have requested funding through the Municipal Vulnerabilities, Vulnerabilities Preparedness Program, the MVP program. Um, we have requested funds and we will hear about that hopefully around January 6th. Okay. So there have been funds requested for this specific action. Okay. And, and so can, can I just continue with my other please question? The other is when I looked at the wording of the proposed uh, act that we're asked to do tonight, it differs from Northampton's, um, and I was curious if it's just we chose to write it in a different way. Northampton, it, it makes it more clear that we're authorizing the town manager to do, or in that case, the mayor to do two things. One is do an aggregation process that we're willing to do that. And the second is go into a joint 
agreement, and in ours it kind of mushes it together into one. Um, so I didn't know whether that was deliberate or inadvertent, because I think we're doing both here. We're going into it with two other towns as aggregation, but we're also saying we want to move to the next step that we'll do this JPI, and then later we're going to set up a public entity. So I was just questioning whether my understanding was right that there are these two steps. Do we do need to authorize each specifically was the question. Well, the, the thing really is J, the, J, uh, the JPA would have to be authorized after or, or in the future. We have to first set it up, go through the process of getting the paperwork done, and then we'd have to come back to the various governments for the actual signing of that. Do we have to authorize the beginning discussion of that to bring it back to us? No, perhaps? this is more to express our intent to move in that direction. Okay. Mandy Joe. So I also have a couple of questions. Um, from the report, it sounds like given the direction we're asking to go, which is the primary purpose is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, that means the primary purpose is not to actually reduce costs to consumers. Um, so I want to be clear that it is very likely that going this route, is, it, what, what is the likelihood, I guess is the question, that going this route will actually increase costs for all of the consumers that don't actually opt out if we go this route? Good question. This one of the parts of this is uh, the costs are competitive. And so if the uh, CCA were to get out of line with Eversource, which I believe is this town's utility, yes. by any great degree, people would start leaving. At, it's because it's a, it's a market mechanism. They would opt out. They would opt out. Um, so we're very conscious of that. And the other thing is, uh, many of the communities in the state, their purpose was to try to save residents money. And we did a study with the uh, CEE. Thank, thank you, Clean Energy Extension um, at UMass, and looking at all the uh, CCAs in the state uh, in 2017, 2018, and found that yes, about half the time they saved people money, and that often amounted to eight to ten dollars a month, usually less. Um, it wasn't like uh, you were going to send anybody's kids to college. But if we retain that, those funds within the CCA, then the estimate is that that would gather about $180,000 a year for one mil uh, per kilowatt hour. And so over several years, we have the ability to build a great, uh, enough resources to both support an organization and begin supporting programs and services. That's basically our, our initial plan here. So can I ask my next question? Please. <laughs> so, so my next one is actually what you've, attempt, you've tried to explain the process, but I'm still having a little difficulty figuring out when, what vote this council takes that makes potentially going this route irreversible. So, so, so let, let me mm -hmm. try to explain that a little more. What does today's, if we vote today, what does that vote bind us to? When is there a possibility at some point if we find out that the rates that you've been able to negotiate are going to be 10% higher than Eversource rates, and this is an, I, I'm just, you know, give, give me, you know, they're, they're going to be 10% higher, and I get the opt, the opt out thing. They do it for lots of things because most people don't opt out. And so that means we would effectively be increasing everyone's rates, and they'd have to affirmatively say, I don't want that. Um, if we find out that's the thing, do we have later on an option to say, no, we're going to pull Amherst out? When is that option? What, what are those next steps that say, here's when it's final, here's when it's not? What kind of say does this council have in what that DPU agreement looks like or doesn't look like? Or what all, I, I'm just trying to get, I, I just don't quite get all of it. Uh, the short answer is we haven't decided yet because you haven't decided yet. 
but we have the option of doing an intermunicipal agreement or the JPA, which is our preference. And if we have a JPA, then every, each town has a member of the board, a voting member of the board, at least one. Okay. And so that is your oversight and your supervision of the, J, of the uh, CCA. And so you're not left out of the process, and, this, and it doesn't go off and just do its own thing. And so if, uh, and what's happened in a couple of CCAs, if they could not get competitive rates, they suspended operation until they could get back into the market. Now that's only been a couple of uh, CCAs, and it's not because they couldn't match Eversource, it's because they couldn't beat Eversource by as much as they told people they would. Okay. So basically, if Eversource can get a price, pretty much we can get a price and we can stay competitive. And that's been the history of the CCAs in the state, that they can at least get uh, match every source. I, you have, I, go ahead. I, but that doesn't quite answer my question okay. of if we pass this at, when we vote, mm -hmm. does that mean Amherst is in a CCA? No. Or is there, so, so when, what vote is the one that says Amherst is a CCA, when, and, and what say do we have in that? So right now you're authoring, authorizing development of a plan that gets approved by the DPU. It's really not until we implement the plan, the plan would have to come back and be reviewed for approval. So there's steps, this is just the sort of the first step. So there's an opportunity after, if this were approved, there'd be another opportunity um, before this goes forward. I think it's hard to say what exactly what the rates will be. I mean, I think it's like anything else um, in terms of rates, you know, even with the utility, their basic rates, their rates go up, their rates go down. Mm -hmm. We're going to face the same thing. Um, our understanding, too, was that um, we spoke with people at the Cape Light Compact and sort of what we were told is that it sort of averages out. Sometimes their rates are above in the basic service rates and sometimes they're below. I mean, so it's not like they're always going to be, you know, um, at a higher rate. So, and it flushes out to be sort of somewhat even in the end. I think I get to your, your, your question here. The statute does not require an approval of the plan. Okay, so that would be a matter of you deciding that that's going to be a part of your process. Well, if it, I guess this is where I'm really confused. If we vote today on this authorization or next week or whenever that vote happens and say, yes, we're authorizing the development of a DPU plan mm -hmm. or submission to DPO, it goes to DPU and DPU approves, mm -hmm. we, it sounds like the statute does not require Amherst to approve that plan for it to go in effect. So if Amherst wanted to require itself to approve that plan for it to go in effect, how do we do that requirement? You said within we could make it part of the process. Who makes it part of that process? Well, first of all, within this organization, again, you have representatives on the board who have to be town officials. And so at that, they are the decision makers to say, yes, the rates are acceptable, we, we go ahead. Okay. If you want a decision point before that, then that would be a matter of you deciding that the, something has to come back to you for a vote. Okay. Yeah. Dorothy. Um, I, I think I understand that rates can go up and down depending upon how big you are and how much power you have in the market, but I don't know how this reduces um, carbon footprint. <laughs> the, the, plan, the, well, the California model, which is what we're trying to uh, follow here, basically takes the resources of uh, the CCA the, and uh, one of the ways of doing this is to charge what's called an adder. Uh, one mil, two mils above what the cost of electricity is to the CCA. One mil is $180,000 a year roughly for the three towns. That money then gets put into both staff and then can be used as resources for programs. Now we haven't decided what programs we're going to want to do. Our consultants have given us a lovely laundry list of possibilities. Uh, but any one of those programs, it could be installing solar equipment. It could, one of the things we've talked about is marketing every, uh, Mass Save. Rather than take over Mass Save, try to promote Mass Save, especially those uh, communities that don't access it effectively. Okay, or putting in programs that um, attract landlords into the process. Okay. 
So it's basically part of this is we suddenly have a lot of choices. We have control of this instead of somebody at the state house deciding where the money goes and what our priorities are going to be. Andy. So uh, thinking of my friends and neighbors who have uh, put, invested in solar on their homes, is there any impact on them if we go into this CCA? There will be no different than they're experiencing now. I assume they're net metering. That, that, that was my question. Yeah, no, there's no impact. It's just they're getting whatever electricity they don't get from their solar, they're going to get from the provider that we contract with. It'll be pretty much transparent for them. They, they won't notice a difference. Do they continue to get the credits from Eversource, the monthly check? Yes. Yeah, basically if they have a surplus and are selling back to Eversource or selling back to the grid, then those, that will continue. That won't be changed. Evan. So I, I, I don't think that Mandy Jo's question was sufficiently mm -hmm. answered. I, I don't and think I, so either. <laughs> and I actually am more confused now than before she asked the question. So my understanding, having read the report, was we were voting today to authorize us to move forward with developing a plan. Then there's a line in the report that say, it, you develop this business plan, and then it says, the three municipalities will each approve the business plan prior to commencing the aggregation. So my thought was, there are two votes to make this happen. One to authorize the development of the plan, and then we vote on the plan. And so to Mandy Joe's point is we could vote today and say, oh, we authorize you to come forward with the plan, and then the plan could come to us and we could say, I don't like this plan, I'm gonna vote no and stop it, or I love this plan, let's go forward. Mm -hmm. But then you just said it's not required by statute for right. us to vote on the plan. So is this our last vote no, unless it, we it, well, dictate otherwise? Here's what you can do, and this is what we did in Pelham. Okay, we put it into the, what we call an article, you call it a, uh, a motion. We put it in that the plan had to come back to town meeting for approval. And so you could amend this motion to put that in there or have a separate motion. But it's not required. By it's not required by state law, no. But we can require it locally. You can require it. Darcy. And another alternative is that um, it would just be approved by the town manager. So it could come up, come back to the full council, or the council could authorize the town manager to approve the final plan. So I have a couple questions. Mm -hmm. Is this essentially creating a public utility? Not, no, because you know, that would be a municipal utility in which you own all the infrastructure like Hoyoke or South Hadley. Right. Okay, this is creating a, well, a municipal aggregation, which basically only deals with the supply side of the, of the equation. The utility still controls all of the uh, delivery in infrastructure, all the wires, all the transformers, all of that. Do the three towns that are presently involved all have Eversource? No, no, Northampton has uh, National Grid. And if you all had the same, would that give you greater bargaining power? No, because we're not bargaining with the utilities. We're bargaining with, bargaining with uh, suppliers. actual suppliers, yeah. Okay. When I, I've been to several meetings on this, even but, before I was elected. Okay. Um, the, and I know that at least initially it was, our goal is to do the aggregation, and then over time we hope that the sources will in fact be carbon neutral. Is that still the goal? No, no, that's, uh, well, I mean, that's a goal, but the goal is to, uh, through this CCA organization, begin to actually implement greenhouse gas reducing projects and programs. And again, it's, uh, we now, our consultants have now identified a number of possible ways of going about that. That's the next step is to, okay, let's start talking about these and see which ones fit our needs in the area. But no, it's not simply to wait for the, great, the grid to get green. In fact, one of the things our consultants are pushing us towards is putting as much renewable energy, mostly solar, off the grid, or what's called behind the meter, so that the energy is used mostly on site, and therefore you're taking um, strain off the grid 
and also you're saving the distribution charges that you know anybody who's got solar in his net metering now is kind of familiar with this idea. Well, we want to do a lot more of that. Okay. Other questions from the council? Evan. Uh, yeah, so uh, CCA 3.0, mm -hmm. um, what, what I couldn't tell by reading the report, and, and you acknowledge in the report, which I think is great, which is everyone has their own definition of what CCA 3.0 is, yeah. um, which is, of course, wonderfully confusing. Um, <laughs> and so I'm trying to figure out what your definition of it is. And one of my, one of my questions is I, I went to the, one of the outreach sessions in 2018 with um, representative from Kate Light mm -hmm. Compact. And my big takeaway message from that was this works great, but don't get into the mass save part. Right. And so, but my reading of this sounds like perhaps that's something that you're considering. And so I, I, I'd like some clarity on okay. what that means and how this interacts with mass save. At least in the task force, um, we have said, we'll keep that in our back pocket. We don't, for one thing, think we're big enough to do it. Um, it's the only time we would want to do that is if we were in Cape Lights situation where we didn't think that our residents were getting their fair share of the money they're giving to, into the Mass Safe Fund. Um, that's why Cape Light did that. They, they did not feel the Cape was getting the return on the money they were putting in. Um, we have no studies now, right now, to show that we aren't being well served by the, our investments. The, um, we do know that the state does not allow a lot of tinkering with the Mass Safe program. It's basically they want it to be statewide, pretty much the same thing. So that, uh, that reason for doing it is kind of taken away from us if we, there was something we wanted to do very specifically for our area. Um, so yeah, right now we're not thinking of taking over the Mass Save program. What we have thought of again is we might be able to help enhance the Mass Save program by getting more people to call and take advantage of it. Andy, Joe, do you have any further questions that you I, I mean, I think my question was eventually answered that, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> that I've got a couple things to say about it in discussion when we get there, but I think the question was eventually gotten to. Okay. Yeah, I do want to make it plain that what you're authorizing now does not put us into the Mass A program. Okay, that is a whole separate process. This is a prerequisite. You have to do this part to get the Mass A, which is why Cape Light has a municipal aggregation. They didn't really want the aggregation part. They wanted the mass save part. Okay. Alyssa. So the motion that you provided us based on your experiences elsewhere and in Pelham and Northampton is not the motion that's in front of us. We altered that. I had a hand in that. And I asked that we have some outreach associated with ensuring that what I had a hand in, which I was trying really hard to track MGL because the report wasn't helping me get there. Um, which I think has been answered by some of these questions, but one of the things that changed, which again, I asked for that to happen, but I'm not clear on why this happened. When I said in the middle of this, and I know it's very long and complicated, but to authorize the Town Manager Act in partnership with other municipalities to develop a plan detailing the process and consequences, this of course is lifted straight from MGL, consequences of aggregation to be reviewed by residents and submitted to the Department of Energy Resources. Instead, that got altered to act in partnership, authorize development, and develop and implementing a plan detailing the process of creating a municipal aggregation. So I'm not really clear on why that was changed because what I was trying to get across is what are we actually authorizing right now and what are our decision points in the future? And I, I think Mandy Jo followed up really well on that. And I feel like that's now gone softer again in the motion that we were finally provided tonight. And so I'm just confused as to, I get the part about how we're initiating the process, which is not what the original motion said, but that is what the Mass General Law says. I get that there are certain steps where it goes to the Department of Energy for approval, and then we could decide, like Pelham did, that they wanted to be able to vote on it. I get that there's a whole separate section that also got dropped out of my motion about developing an energy plan in order to qualify for funding, which does require our approval but it's not a step that one has to undertake. It's in part two of the MGL that Athena so kindly provided for all of you. So I just wanna make sure, since I don't know who saw what when, we're clear on 
if we vote tonight, what exactly we think we'll end up with after we voted it. Um, Athena, would you put the motions up, please? It's, yeah, it's that one, thank you. So this is what you were referring to, Alyssa? This is the, mod the modified, modified version, <laughs> which is great. I just wanna make sure, I don't know what a plan detailing the process of creating a municipal aggregation is. I didn't use those words, and so I don't know why we went back to those words. And so I'm just trying to get, you know, what's our part that we're authorizing, and then it might come back to us, like at the funding stage, like I understood the division there. That's not right. mentioned anymore in this motion. But I'm not clear on the middle part, I guess. Yes, thank you. Other comments, questions? Shalini. So this seems too good to be true. So I just wanna know what are the risks, and especially for lower income people, but you know, when you, with the task force, particularly where this did, where CCA did fail, and how can we anticipate those risks, and what can we do to mitigate those risks? Very few CCAs in the state have actually shut down operation, and the couple that did, um, it was because they were wanting to save a significant amount of money. Um, over the utility price and weren't able to do that. And they did not have any green goals or anything of that nature. They were all about saving money. Um, the risks, oh, my, the biggest risk I can see because basic municipal aggregation has been working successfully for towns all across the state. There's well over 100 of them. So that part of the operation, it, it works. It doesn't save anybody a lot of money. Sometimes you can buy, you can do a CCA 2.0 as we've described in the report and you know green up your supply a bit off the grid. For me the biggest risk is that we don't uh, push forward to the 3.0 level. That we don't get significant greenhouse gas reductions. That we don't transform our energy profile. Um, and there there's also risk because there you're starting to make investments in projects and programs. And so there's a risk that, in any case like that, that it may not work. But that should not endanger the basic aggregation. In fact, a lot of that activity will happen outside of the aggregation, the, the legal content that the DP was interested in. Okay. Um, as one consultant pointed out, a lot of the things we want to do are things that towns can do already, or towns and cities can do already, uh, with similar funding sources. One of the things this project gives us is a chance to coordinate between towns to make it more regional and more strategic. And also to start generating resources that we have control over as opposed to, again, uh, chasing grants that somebody else has decided what's important. And we should add um, also to answer part of your question that equity is a big piece of what we want to develop. So in the de development of a plan and working with that strategy, we want to include that as kind of a a secondary goal, if you will, um, as well. So that is something we've discussed and something that we've prioritized. Yeah, we've, we've listed about a half a dozen secondary goals, which I look at them as, okay, our primary goal is greenhouse gas reductions. We can try to go at that a lot of different ways, but once we have a couple of competing possibilities, we look at those secondary goals and say, okay, which one satisfies more of those than the other one? So it's equity, resilience, uh, economic develop local economic development, okay, all of those things also would, and again, we're not going to be the decision makers. Ultimately, it's going to be people from the, the, city, the municipal governments basically sitting on the boards making these decisions. But this is the framework. This is our learnings right now. Oh, I, don't, I don't say yes. She does. <laughs> Sorry. The follow-up question, mm -hmm. and you don't have to maybe explain it now if it's taking too much time, but could you send me information why having green goals makes it more likely to succeed than just focusing on the, um, the cost reduction? It, define, it, well, it depends on what you define as succeed and what your goals are. It, since we've defined a primary goal as greenhouse gas reductions, then, yeah. 
<laughs> but would, if people opt out, would that be sustainable then? I mean, as a town, yes, we're committed to that, but we can't force that those goals on people if they can't afford it, so. Right, the experience with existing CCAs is that if they keep their rates competitive, people don't opt out. Even if they're occasionally a little above Eversource or the utility, they don't opt out. Oh. Evan? Uh, the last question is, uh, and the development of local renewable distributed energy sources. Uh, so is the thought that the, the revenue generated would actually be used to perhaps like purchase land and, have, and develop a solar, what, what, I, I'm curious what that looks like in actuality. There's a, a number of different models that the consultants have described for us. Um, one possibility is that the CCA actually buys and owns projects. The other is that it creates a um, revolving loan fund and actually enables uh, residents to, um, over time, establish equity in a project. And, um, and yes, it gets really detailed and complicated. But then, you know, that's two possibilities, is we increase the amount of ownership, and including targeted ownership towards um, low and middle income people, people who right now can't afford, or renters. It allows them to buy into, basically, ownership in a project that's not on their property. I asked this um, at one point, at least once before. Um, if other surrounding towns want to join us, how does that happen? And what's the price of entrance? Yeah. That hasn't been de determined. Um, what we do know is we would have to go back to the DPU with an amended plan. But that's the only thing we know about that process because it hasn't been de decided. This, the JPA board would decide such a thing. It would be part of the rules of the organization is, you know, do they have to pay a fee to come in? And it's likely, so in our experience with Valley Bike Share, which is an intermunicipal um, entity and, and agreement, that was spelled out in how we were going to develop um, and grow as an organization, if you will. And so I would imagine that similarly, that would be spelled out as to how other communities could join in the development of the business plan will identify how other communities could join along. Um, it doesn't mean that they could automatically join in, but we would identify a process for which that to happen. It, so is this a nonprofit or a quasi-public corporation? I think the latter. It's the latter, yeah. okay. If, if we form a JPA, it is a separate uh, body politic. Right. And the advantage of that is, of course, that the underlying municipalities are indemnified. Right, okay. got it. That, that helps me, thank you. Alyssa. Okay, so this is gonna be hopefully an easy multiple choice question. <laughs> in the MGL, it says Department of Energy Resources. Mm -hmm. Now the MGL is not always updated to show exactly how agencies change names, but suddenly the new motion sheet says Department of Public Utilities. Yeah. Is that a typo? Is that just the name that the agency's called now and MGL hasn't caught up? What's going on with that? No. The uh, statute requires us to go to the Department of Energy Resources for advice. It's the DPU that actually approves the plan. It says MGL for mm -hmm. from Department of Energy Resources. Read the, would you read the whole section, that whole piece? I, I hope not. <laughs> well, <laughs> the, the sentence that talks about the Department of Energy Resources. Okay. They're two separate agencies, and while we are developing the plan, we have to do that in consultation with the Department of Energy Resources. But the, the DPU is not It's called the agency in the statute. But it's not referring to the same agency. Right, right, right. This, okay. yeah, 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 it took me a while. When I first read the statute, it's like, wait a minute, where's the DPU in this? Uh -huh. <laughs> Shalini. So this sounds like a startup. So where does the funding come? Let's say we get the plan going. Yep. Where will the funding and what does how, what sort of funding is needed to s launch that? There are two approaches to this. Uh, one is what most every community in the state accepts. Um, Cape Light Compact, what most of the CCAs have done, which is to hire a broker or contract with a broker 
to who provides all the startup funds and shepherds it through the DPU and does the whole process for you turnkey. And for that, they take one mil per year. One mil, basically, for the length of the contract, three years. So in our case, that company would get over a half a million dollars for doing that work, $180,000 a year for three years. And we estimate that work probably costs between $100,000 and $150,000. Okay. So what we are doing is trying to get that, those startup funds up front, okay, either totally up front or be able to borrow some of it and pay it back out, out of that mill for the first year and then start hiring staff with that money and building the organization over time. And so it is like a startup. Um, Mr. Bachman. I should also note that um, we have staff time who's being, de who's being dedicated to this. That's cost to the town. The city of Northampton is the same. They're dedicating staff to this, and we have a lot of volunteer hours that are being dedicated. So that's where the startup sort of comes from, the startup cost, plus the um, money that the state legislators have gotten, uh, which has been passed, and it's $50,000 that is already in the bank, basically. Yes. And we also got a, a USDN grant, uh, Urban Sustainability Directors Network grant of 75000 which paid for the consultants to, do, to basically to find the answers to the questions that we weren't not knowledgeable enough to answer. Darcy. And just speaking of volunteer time, I just would like to point out there are seven members of the Intermunicipal Task Force here. Actually, if you could inter introduce them, that I was, would be I was great. actually going to. So <laughs> great. <laughs> I was just waiting for a break and an opportunity to do that. So. Uh, I, yeah. Is the council ready for me, us to move to some public comment? That doesn't mean we won't back come back to our own discussion, but... Why don't we do that by having you introduce people and then we'll move to public comment. Yes. So um, along with Councillor Dumont, um, we have Sam Teitelman, who is a um, newly, um, <coughs> newly arrived Amherst resident. Um, and then we have Adele Franks, who's representing the city of Northampton. Um, we also have River Strong, who is with the UMass Clean Energy Extension. Andra Rose, who is um, in this role, I guess, both with the ECAC and also um, with the Western Mass Community Choice Aggregation Advocacy Group. That right? And Dwayne Breger um, behind Andra, who is with the UMass Clean Energy Extension. Great. Um, I just want to ask that we not spend public comment being repetitive of each other, just uh, comments that you feel would help the council maybe understand this better uh, and or um, understand the depth of support. So who would like to make public comment? Okay. I see two people here and I'm maybe there. Let's start <laughs> over here. Okay. Please come forward. To the mic. Yes. Thank you. My name is Adele Franks, and I am a resident of Northampton and a participant on the Intermunicipal CCA Task Force. And most of what I was going to say has already been said, so I'm not going to repeat it. Um, but I will add that um, Northampton is very eager uh, to move forward, but we really don't want to move forward alone. Uh, it's been a wonderful collaboration on the task force. Um, we have been greatly benefiting from shared expertise, and we share values, and we share goals of greenhouse gas reduction. And uh, we, would, we would love to take the next steps together um, with Amherst and Pelham. And hopefully, I think we all on the task force would very much like other communities to join eventually. Um, but we have come a long way together, and we would like to take the next step together. And I would also just like to add that the way I look at, at this um, program, it's a way of keeping our money in our communities. Because we're going to spend about the same amount for electricity no matter what we do. But if we're paying Eversource or National Grid, we're, they're, they're using that money for their administrative costs. If we pay a broker, then the brokers, you know, the, the company the broker works for is, is getting the profit, but the money's not staying in our communities. 
And what we're proposing is a way to basically charge people the same amount of money for their electricity, but to benefit our communities by keeping our money here so that we can invest in distributed energy resources, solar on parking lots, et cetera, and, uh, and, and to our mutual benefit. So we hope that we will be able to move forward and take these next steps together. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, you had public comment? You. Everybody wants to clear out, I guess. I'm Sam Teitelman. I'm a member of the Amherst Pelham Northampton Intermunicipal Aggregation Task Force. I'm also an Amherst resident, District 4 at 25 Greenleaves Drive. I wanted to share some written remarks uh, that I made uh, as a resident, and I think I'm going to try to annotate them briefly in real time to address some of the questions you've raised as well. I'll maybe try to, but still keep it short. Um, I'd like to urge the council to exercise its authority to take meaningful local action to address the challenges of climate change by authorizing the development of an aggregation program in, uh, in participation with other communities with the primary goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The language in front of you is simply to authorize development of a Part A aggregation program, Part A under the statute. It has nothing to do with the Mass Save program or Part B under the statute. It's a completely separate authorization and separate DPU approval. As the language is currently drafted, you would not have any further review over this process. That would go to the town manager. You could amend this language so that it came back to you, as it was previously stated, so that you could have further approval, say. By doing so, you would want to consider the fact that funding that's channeled into the development of the aggregation plan, it, that plan that gets paid for is now contingent upon further approval. So it creates levels of uncertainty. But okay. By creating an aggregation program, Amherst will be giving its residents and businesses more control over where our energy comes from and how it's produced and give us the option, but not the requirement to purchase electricity from a program that offers local oversight and accountability to its customers. There's an opt-out period before the aggregation program begins supplying power and then it continues onward. Customers can opt out at any time. Well over 100 municipalities throughout Massachusetts have adopted aggregation programs, many of which are increasing the amount of renewable energy in their community's electricity supplies beyond the requirements of the Commonwealth's Renewable Portfolio Standard, primarily through the purchase of additional renewable energy credits designed to foster the development of additional renewable generation capacity. Those programs that are offering greener energy supply are doing it at rates that are competitive with their utilities basic service. More often than not, they're beating their basic service. Whether or not they're above or below the basic service rate, on average, it's by a margin of a few dollars a year, not even a month. You might be talking about a difference of five to $10 a year. Some of these programs offer greener supply than what's required under the renewable portfolio standard by default, and others make that an option for their customers. They can opt up to a greener supply, but the default is the same as the basic service, whatever's required that year under the RPS. And your aggregation program can make those decisions accordingly. Okay. Some aggregation programs are going further than that. Cape Light Compacts developed 28 and a half megawatts of solar PV capacity for the Cape Cod and Martha's Vineyard municipalities. Uh, very briefly, Cambridge has developed a solar, or is developing a local solar PV program to provide a portion of its customers' electricity needs. Nantucket provides a financial incentive for customers to install solar PV. These communities are only scratching the surface of what CCAs could potentially do but you're not authorizing an ambiguous or amorphous 3.0 program right now. You're authorizing a basic program that includes a goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Thus, the program becomes a platform for doing more than simply buying competitive power supply. Okay. And what those additional steps will be, they'll be financially feasible, they'll be lawful, and they'll be according to what your community wants and needs and is capable of doing. So it will be a progression over time. I have to ask you to complete. Thank you. Thank you very okay. much. Are there any other public comments? 
Hi, Andrew Rose. I am speaking as uh, for the ECAC that um, we voted to support um, authorization of a CCA program that has its primary um, purpose as reducing greenhouse gas um, jointly with these other communities, and that was in your packet, so I won't read it to you. But that's it. Thank you. Chris? Chris Riddle, 252 Strong Street, uh, just a plain citizen, um, not representing anybody but me, um, but I think that this is something that we need to do. I hope very much that this council uh, will uh, move ahead in, uh, to the next step. This is a, 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 a very exciting thing. What's ex a particular part of it that's exciting to me, well, the only thing that's exciting about it really is re greenhouse gas reductions. Um, and, and I'm interested in, well, uh, my, my, my interest is in buildings, existing building stock. And uh, one, and how do we address that problem and try to get to uh, the uh, uh, net zero by 2040 or 2050? Um, uh, when I heard about this the, at first, I thought, well, this is, this is great. Then that means that we're moving toward a time when when you plug something into the wall, out comes 100% uh, uh, renewable electricity. And then, so then all you have to do is to take that the building stock that's out there, the existing buildings that are, go on forever toward the horizon, and, uh, and make them electrified, and bingo, you've got the building stock converted to being net zero. Um, that is not that simple, and I don't think, my understanding is that this, that the uh, CCA 3.0 program is uh, at least not expiring to get to 100% renewable uh, soon, maybe by 2050, maybe by 20, I don't know, I'm sort of curious about what actually a projected timeline might be, but Whatever, it's if green, uh, greenhouse, greenhouse gas reductions is the goal, and that's my goal, and so I think uh, this is a very exciting prospect that I hope the council will support. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments at this time? Please come forward. Hello. This is on, yes. Elisa Pearson, Pelham. When I was serving on the select board in Pelham, uh, the CCA came before us and what attracted me to it was the idea that we who use electricity are paying a kind of a mortgage. Every month out it pours. And uh, here's an opportunity to own what we want to keep in and local. And electricity likes to stay local um, as a selectman uh, we reviewed a CCA where we would have used, uh, we would have purchased something that looked, that was greener. But uh, what troubled me was that it was sort of green on paper. These were, um, it was a sleight of hand, it was uh, Texas wind. So those electrons that I was going to be having in my house were not going to be green, but I was benefiting from a sort of a, a, a mechanism. So this, to me, feels very real and very true and very local. And I like, I like the implication that with, with that half a million dollars over three years and some very passionate people and your guidance sending the right person to that group, um, they would be thinking really hard about green electrons here and people building those and maintaining those in our communities, uh, not just some, some paper somewhere. So thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments from the public at this time? We're back to the council, and I just would like to propose something, okay? Um, and you may decide this is not what you want. <laughs> um, this is only our first reading, if you will. We usually require these for two. And I would like to know from Stephanie and perhaps yourself, um, is is anything dramatic going to happen between now and just January 6th that would, uh, by us waiting till then to vote, 
No, would... not till January 6th. Okay. So if we decide we would like to have a second shot at this, on December 6th, that would be, January, but yeah. I mean, December, <laughs> I'm sorry, January 6th, 2020, we would not be stopping you dead in your tracks? No. Okay. What I would say is if we could, um, beyond that date, might become problematic only in that, then that slows down the next steps and moving towards development of a plan. And because we have funding for a limited period of time, we would hope that you would be able to make a decision on this. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, the other thing that I personally would like to see is that the motion that we eventually vote on be broken into two and include something that allows us to have another shot at this, such as Pelham required, and rather than sit here tonight and wordsmith a motion <laughs> at, um, you know, going on 10 o'clock, I'd suggest that we do that for our meeting on the 6th instead. Now, that was my proposal. That may not be what the council would like. Mandy Jo? So I would support that. Um, I definitely want to see something that requires this town to approve that DPU plan or whatever plan it's called. I think, I don't know whether this language has gone through our town attorney or not, but especially if we're adding provisions like that, I would definitely want it through our town attorney to make sure it's, you know, legally binding and all on things because I know the statute itself doesn't require that. And so I want to make sure we have the ability to. Andy. Right. So do you, so I guess we need to just clarity of who would be approving the town manager or the town council? We'd like it to come back. I, to I the wouldn't the come back to the council. Yep. I yeah, what I was thinking about was along similar lines, and I think that it could be handled as a, an amendment to the motion or words so that we have a clean vote, that we have the motion as it would be proposed, and then somebody able to make an amendment and then debate the, the amendment. And I think it might be fairly simple. I actually was working at it a little bit. If you knocked out the words and implement, and then after the words municipal aggregation put in to be approved by the Amherst Town Council, that essentially does what we wanted to do. Um, I would want to have the opportunity to have um, others than me look at that, um, but we can come back at the next meeting and have a, uh, a very robust conversation on whether to pass it as it's been proposed originally or with an amendment like I just suggested. Other comments from the council? Dorothy? Um, I want to know if perhaps one of the eventual goals is to um, separate us from the, the big grid, which we know is in bad shape and goes out, um, to self-sustained energy, which is local and controlled. Is that where things might move? That is a strategy that we are looking at and talked about. Um, it's all going to depend on resources. And part of that is the ability to build microgrids. And right now, the state and the utility are hampering that effort. So right. it'll get hopefully easier at, because parts of the state are actually promoting it and parts are getting in the way. <laughs> As someone who'd like to go off the grid. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Pat. Um, I was once in a play called What's Her Name in Wonderland, but that's another story. Um, I'm ready to vote now with a little wordsmithing. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be outvoted on that, but this is, a, this is something that I've been looking at for a long time, and I see nothing but positives. So I would like us to move forward tonight. Are there other comments? Yes, uh, Alyssa. I was just going to say that if we do end up making notes for the future, as I'm sure someone wrote down um, on Mr. Steinberg's behalf, et cetera, is that I don't like the change in wording that says to act in partnership with other municipalities and authorize. That's not the wording I used for a reason. We do not just tell the town manager to act in partnership with other municipalities. Go do it. We 
for a purpose. We direct for a purpose, not to just say you have that authority now because to a large extent he has that authority already. And so what we're trying to tell him is what we want him to do in working with the other powers. And I would also like it to be re looked at the idea of incorporating the MGL part that talks about the separate energy plan that's later in the process associated with funding because I think that would be important. I would have thought that that would be important to our community that that separate step that's after the fact would make us eligible for some funding and yet that's not addressed in here at all. And so if we're throwing a whole bunch of things together, I'm not sure why we wouldn't wanna address that as a separate later step. Part, um, I believe you're talking about part B of the statute. That is an entirely separate process. It, it actually requires a, another authorization and a whole nother plan, a much more detailed plan. Okay, um, I mean, it, you, it's not like this could kick that off by just putting it in here. Could would legally authorize that. And so I'm saying we are in fact trying to give quite a bit of authority to the town manager to make things happen and to not slow okay. things down. We may have this separate step where things come back to us, but this plan would also come back to us. And so I grant you, I understand completely, they're two separate plans, but just like it doesn't change from department to DPU in the middle of a paragraph, we need to be really clear on what we're authorizing. The motion we originally got didn't do that. We're still not quite there. And so I'm asking that please you work with the president to make sure we get these questions answered in whatever our final version of this yeah, is. Thank you, Evan. So, I wasn't sure if I wanted to say this now or save it for agenda item 8E, but I think given Pat's comment, I'll, I'll say it now. So uh, last meeting, we agreed uh, to vote to suspend Rule 8.4, which requires us to consider in one meeting and vote in another meeting. And I feel as though we sort of opened the floodgates with that because now we have a motion sheet that has three different motions voting to suspend 8.4, one of which we determined was unnecessary. Voting on this tonight would require suspending that rule. Um, and so I guess my first thoughts on that are, if we're gonna just always be suspending rule 8.4, <laughs> then we should just get rid of rule 8.4. Right. But if we have 8.4, it seems like the value of that is one, so that we as a council can listen to debate, discussion, and then take time to think before the next meeting. But the other more important thing is that it gives the public an opportunity to see coverage of this that might appear in the paper and to know that they, a decision wasn't made before it was on their radar and to weigh in. We can decide that we don't agree with that and we can repeal Rule 8.4 and if you wanna do that, you should tell our chair of GOL you wanna do that. Um, <laughs> but as long as we have 8.4 in the books, I am, I am really hesitant to continuously vote to suspend it and especially to do so without cause and so my request going forward would be any time I see a motion to suspend Rule 8.4, I want an explanation about why. Why is it necessary that we, we do it? I don't see any real reason to suspend the rule in this case. Uh, there's no emergency. There's no time limit on a grant as with the last one. Um, and so given, given that and given that we've got confirmation there's no harm in waiting until the 6th, um, I don't see why we would vote to suspend a rule sort of just because. All right. At this point, I need to get a sense of the council. I propose that we have the vote on this on January 6, 2020, which is our next meeting, that between now and then, we work on the motions, which we may need to come back to you, and also, in a legitimate way, consult with other councilors, um, so that we're not breaking open meeting law. Uh, and we come up with at least two motions, maybe even a third one, mm -hmm. given this other MG, Mass General Law that Alyssa was referring to. Um, and then there are others who would like to perhaps go ahead and vote tonight. So I need a sense of whether you want to try to proceed or not. So the best way to do that, one way to do that, which I really truly wanna say I don't want to see, is that we put the motion forward and we vote it down. And I don't want that on the record. So I would rather put forward the motion that we delay action on this to the 6th of January, 2020. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 
Uh, oh, right. discussion? I'm just trying to figure out what the actual motion is, and is it necessary when the rule says the default is? It, it, what all, that's true. That's a very good question. <laughs> the, def, the default in our rules is we would we not would act wait, tonight. Wait. So. Okay. Yeah, there, the, the other way to look at it is you could make a motion to suspend, and then if the motion to suspend the rule okay. fails, you, you're where you were. Okay. All right. Let's do this. I move to suspend rule 8.4. Is there a second? Okay. All those in favor of suspending rule 8.4, raise your hand and say aye. All those opposed? Raise your hand and say no. Yay. Abstain. No, I voted. Okay. <laughs> this is now moving to our next meeting, which is January 6th. Stephanie, uh, I look forward to working with you on the wording of those motions and so forth. Yes. And thank you for all the hard work your group has done. I have been following you. And this does help us move forward in some many different ways. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now, our very patient bylaw review. Just to be very clear with the council, this is a first reading and there will be no vote. Okay? So, we have before us... Oh, Bob Ritchie, Bernie Kubiak. And they have been loyal members of the previous bylaw review committee and now this bylaw review committee, which also includes Evan Ross, Pat DeAngelis, and... Alyssa Brewer. And I will only say they have learned more about our bylaws than we would ever hope. But thank you for all your work. Shall we proceed? Yes, and I expect and hope to be mercifully brief. Uh, you have 10 to 20 pounds of material, and I don't intend yes. to cover any of that. I'd like to use the limited time that I've assigned myself to just thank the members of the committee, uh, starting with Kay Moran, uh, Ken Hargreaves, uh, Bernie, Pat, Evan and Alyssa, uh, and Jeff Kravitz for absolutely monumental work in producing the documents that you have. Uh, we tried to steer this process from uh, data of creation, which was uh, precisely one year to the day from the day we sent it to you last week. Right. Our mission was to get this done within a year, and I think we accomplished that to the extent that we did zoning in July, and we've, we've given you the report with our recommendations for the general bylaws. Uh, it, it is a fulfillment of the charge to review, make recommendations, and to uh, uh, come up with a plan for implementing it. Uh, we have uh, delivered you documents, which I think cover the waterfront. Uh, these documents uh, will allow you to trace the trail that we, we took. There is an audit trail with a number of drafts uh, and what you have before you represents a plateau and a mountain climb. Uh, there's more to do. Uh, what we've given to you as a draft uh, set of bylaws is significantly less imperfect than what we started with, and, but there's work to do. So we've given you a draft. We've also given you a list of things that we think, if we were council members, we'd like to have another crack at. Right. So that's where you go on from where we leave off. Uh, our job is done. And by giving you the report, uh, I, I think Bernie has come up with a, 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 a way of saying this. Uh, we've built a platform on which you can stand going forward, and we hope it serves the purposes for which we were created. Thank you. Bernie. And uh, it is, it's a start. It's a start. There's some recommendations and going forward. I think overall what we'd like to see the council develop is sort of an operations manual for the town of Amherst, where citizens can go to a single place, a single web page, find the charter, 
the bylaws, the special acts, and the, accept the accepted statutes, and critically, the policies, procedures, and regulations of the town. All there, all searchable, all readable, and at some point interlinked. So if we can do that, and this is a place to start, uh, I think um, folks in Amherst will be well served and the government will, will reach a level of transparency that you don't often find. Finally, the, there was a cross-document platform with some consistency among all of the documents that we looked at. We've created a template for future changes so that the changes work with each other and integrate the zoning bylaws with the general bylaws to the extent that's necessary. Uh, the document that we put together has both an alphabetic e index so that anybody looking at it in digital format will have e ease of navigating from place to place. So I think that's, we'd like to end there and expose ourselves to your questions, if you have any, on what we've done, but um, we hope what we've given you is perspective enough uh, to go forward. Thank you. Uh, would members from the, I'm checking on it, just a factoid here. Um, would members from the committee like to speak? Alyssa? This was a fantastic committee to work on. You should all be really jealous because even though it doesn't sound all that exciting, it was r really interesting to take what they'd done and then take it uh, a little further based on the kinds of conversations we've been having here at town council. And the leadership provided by Bob and Jeff was amazing. Bernie was always there to tell us, practically speaking, how things worked other places. You could have not have asked for a more amazing group to work with, so you should definitely all be jealous. Evan? Uh, so I also want to thank Bob and Bernie, um, I think the counselors on the committee were there in many ways to offer our input, but also to, to sort of provide the perspective of the council. But the real work of this committee um, were Bob and Bernie and also Jeff, uh, who must be very happy to be done with this <laughs> work, because um, we put him through a lot, and I feel bad for that. Um, but, but one thing I do want to make sure I, I stress that, that Bob said is, is that this, the document that you've received is not, our bylaws are perfect, and so you don't even have to work. It, it, it's, it's an improvement, um, and there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, and so I think that future considerations document that you received um, is going to be really useful going forward. Um, and one of the things I want to say to the members of the council is that a lot of the things on that future considerations document aren't like the sexy things that you want to get headlines in the paper for working on, um, but they're important things that, that I hope people will pick up um, going forward. Okay. Pat. I just want to say thank you to Bob and Bernie and Jeff and Alyssa and Evan. It's one of the best committees I've sat on. Um, in terms of hard work and commitment and humor. So I appreciated it very much and learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Let me, I just want to state for the public record, we discussed it and adopted a charge for this committee, but we did not appoint the committee until January 28th, 2019. So we're still within the one year limit are you reporting back? I was afraid you'd say that. <laughs> yeah. I just want to be very clear that we're within the charter and we've met that requirement. So are there questions, comments at this time? Mandy Jo. Start with me. Um, so I, I'm going to put two hats on. The first one's as a charter commissioner. Wow. Um, I think when the charter commission put this into the transition section, we were thinking, oh, we'll change all the select board to whatever and have, we need a committee to do stuff like that and that's what they'll do and it'll get done. You guys went above and beyond what I think anyone on the Charter Commission ever expected for this review at this time. It's what we would have hoped for for the 10 year decennial review. Um, so I, I can't express from the Charter Commission point of view my appreciation too much. Um, now I'm going to put my counselor hat on. And I'm going to say, you know, I was one that sent you guys a ton of comments. And last night I went through all of my comments that I sent you weeks ago 
and color coded them as to what was dealt with where and all of that. And I ended up with just one that I'm not happy with how you dealt with, which given how many I had, <laughs> and I'm sure some people can figure out which one it was, um, but um, yeah, you know, you took our comments and you considered them and you gave us back a document that said, yeah, we heard you, but we don't agree, or yes, that's a good one for future consideration, or this and that, and, and as a counselor who wasn't involved in this process, I wanna say thank you for that too, because it made me, as an individual, feel like I did have some say before we get to this point. So are you gonna talk about the one? I mean, I can mention it, and I'll probably yeah. make a motion next <laughs> week, but... Um, <laughs> It, okay. it, it was the lawnmower one, <laughs> and Evan's like, I know that's what it is. I, I really, I still don't like the fact that it's, it's being added, and, and I will probably move next week to delete it from, from the whole set of bylaws for future consideration at GOL. If you, but, if you move next week, none of us will be here, but that's okay. <laughs> at the next meeting. <laughs> I won't be here next week. Okay. Uh, yes. Kathy. Okay, I do want to thank you all for the mountain of work and the level of it meant that when I got my first chance to read all the changes, I didn't read as carefully as I think Mandy did, uh, particularly where things were completely deleted. Um, so I have a question on one of them and I had to go back and read the original bylaw to figure out what was in it. And it's the piece on condominiums and co-op conversions. And I could see in reading that why you might want to do some substantial revisions. Um, what I saw is that the rationale of why the entire thing was deleted is that we haven't really needed it because it hasn't really happened in Amherst, you know, so don't worry about it. So then I went over to zoning and planning and put the word condominium in, and it's kind of silent on it. So they were several protections in that bylaw for what could happen and um, and I understood why they were in and there are things of if, if someone who owns a large apartment complex decides for whatever reasons that they would prefer to convert them into owner. There were protections that they can't harass the tenants to try to get them out of there so they can argue, you know, look, we have all these vacancies. There was tenants' first rights of, a, of refusal of you know, I'll buy in um, some process kinds of things on uh, how soon and how fast. So by wholesale deleting it, you we've removed some things that we might someday need, even if we hadn't activated them. And so I'm, I'm just curious on why the total removal, because I know how protective they've been in places that are worried about it. And so we had that long prologue of what people were worried about. And it's great, it hasn't happened in Amherst, but what if um, some of the big apartment buildings, since we now have them, <laughs> um, said, you know, I'd rather get out of the rent of business and get into the ownership. So, so that was my question, and having said that, there were some changes in that section I would have made that I thought didn't make sense, so it wouldn't have been keep it just as is, it would have required a different discussion. So just some rationale on why just get rid of it, where you were more careful with dogs and cats and things and saying, let's keep this one, we might not need it, or you know, you kept something on the books that may be a state law protected, because there's nothing, I don't think, locally that's protective if this is gone. Back in the 80s, this was a real hot topic. Uh, and it's the fear, but yep. putting a law on the book to yep. protect you in case something happens is not a bad thing to do, even if it never happens. Yeah, but the incidence probability kept descending. And during, the, uh, during our sessions, uh, we had input from people that predicted that uh, its utility back then is absent today. Uh, the other thing to take in mind that there are so many more appropriate and contemporary tools to deal with the problems that condominium conversion regulation uh, sought to achieve that it became not the tool of choice in dealing with some of those issues. Uh, condominium form of ownership is not, uh, is not a kind of title. It's not something that zoning does. Uh, so zoning has limited reach 
on uh, the ownership of, of, of real estate. Um, and so there were a whole bunch of reasons why we thought that in the interest of producing a, a, uh, a concise uh, a set of laws that govern uh, our, our, our town of a non-zoning nature, uh, it was neater not to have this. Uh, the council could easily put it back in if it chose. Uh, Can you, and so it you could said, also you adopt said there are other things staff. that are, excuse me, please it, it, could it could adopt it from whole cloth in the future if it chose to do so. Um, th it was just our thought that this was the better uh, option at this stage. And you said there are other laws that are protective the way this is, that there are other tools that the town already has on its books somewhere? Well, I didn't say necessarily that it was the town laws, but there are uh, land use uh, uh, options available uh, in, the, in the private marketplace under state statute uh, that uh, allow the uh, mischief that condominium conversion posed back in the 80s that is diminishing the, uh, the availability of affordable housing stock, for example. Uh, these things are addressed by more surgical uh, instruments than condominium conversion. Uh, the inputs that we got from the uh, town staff uh, back then mm -hmm. uh, indicated that this was the better course to follow, and we sort of went along with that idea. And I, I don't believe in the town attorney has we best it for the town attorney's opinion on our work from time to time, and um, she certainly didn't object to our removing this piece. But Bob's point's well taken. I mean, if the council feels this is uh, a compelling topic, then the right thing to do, I think, would be to have the, uh, the GOL committee query town attorney for a more precise and, and workable um, bylaw that can be added back in. Okay. Are there other comments? I'm sorry, Darcy. Uh, I also want to thank you so much for your mammoth amount of work that you put into this. Um, I just have one one comment that's, you know, um, the single-use plastic bag prohibition. The, this is the only thing that really stuck out to me. Um, and I'm sorry that I didn't make my comment earlier. Um, that um, that the, the the committee recommended deletion of an aspirational section that encouraged customers to bring reusable bags and encourages encouraged establishments to provide reusable, biodegradable, compostable, or recyclable paper bags. And I I get that that. You said the reason was it was aspirational, but I think in this particular era, that's okay. We can be aspirational. We just passed some pretty aspirational climate goals, and this fits with that. So I guess I would really like to put that back in there. Well, I think you're absolutely <laughs> right. You can certainly put aspirational statements in the bylaws, but the, the uh, approach taken by the committee was to uh, reduce the working parts to those that were essential. Uh, if statements of purpose or statements of aspiration are uh, mistaken to be operative, it could lead to litigation. It could lead to other adverse consequences. So looking at the bylaw, we said, what does the bylaw do? Let's keep the language that expresses what the bylaw does and how it works. Uh, the purposes of the bylaw don't add anything to the functionality of the bylaw, but they do offer, as you point out, an educational medium. It, it, it communicates to the public mm -hmm. what, what it's about. So it's entirely appropriate, and the committee did leave in a number of statements of purposes and statements of aspiration uh, where we thought it was appropriate. And you raised one in which it may, the council may wish to stick that back in again. But uh, we, we, we sought to reduce the volume, we did it down to 95 pages. Uh, where do you stop? And I think we, we just drew the line at that one. Mm -hmm. And we, we did, uh, wherever there was, because keep in mind that these bylaws were created by a series of town meetings with different authors over an 80 year period. So we did take a look at all of the preambles and the whereas's and, and the, the other language and say, does it serve a meaningful purpose now? And if it doesn't serve a purpose, let's, move it aside. 
Um, again, the council is free to, you've got a process, you're free to, the council's free to put that language back. But we, what we tried to do, and you'll notice when you look at the bylaws, you'll notice the data block, and you'll notice there's bulleted lists, and you notice that there's layered ways. We tried to make those by, bylaws readable and usable. Um, so uh, if we were a little bit too rigorous in knocking out some of the aspirational language, then by all means the council can put it back. But that will, what we were trying to do is get people right to the heart of the bylaw, and we kept only what we felt uh, was explanative of the bylaw. And it wasn't that the committee thought that these expressions weren't worth making, but that the bylaws themselves were not the right vehicle. Uh, there are places in which this aspirational language should be developed and advanced and promulgated, but not within the four corners of a working regulatory document. Mm -hmm. And so we were trying to draw the line at stuff that was part of the functionality of the regulation and uh, move everything else to the side for treatment in some other venue. Okay. Evan. Yeah, just, just to build on that, I think one of the lenses that I consistently looked at the bylaws through when we were looking at language was, is it enforceable or operational? And, and if you, and so things that were sort of statements of uh, intent or, or aspirational, uh, you can't enforce them, you can't operationalize them, um, and so the bylaws seemed like the, in the in the proper place for that. And so um, I think that's a useful lens that I learned to look, I mean, I, I certainly grew a lot during this experience of, of going through these, and that's sort of the lens I grew to look at these through is when I looked at language, I go, I agree with that, and I go, yeah, but can you actually operationalize that? And if you couldn't, it, it wasn't appropriate in the bylaw. So just sharing that learning experience with all of you. If the regulatory content is embedded within a chunk of dense text, what people go to the bylaw to read, they won't find as easily. Right. So we tried to leave a residue of the stuff that mattered. And not that the stuff that is aspirational doesn't matter, it's just that it should matter elsewhere. Okay. Are there other comments about our questions about the bylaws that you, things that you've raised before that you've seen taken out or whatever. And the reason I'm asking this is because I, I will send you an email. I would like if you want to forward any motions regarding bylaws at our meeting on the 6th, I'm going to ask that you provide those to me at least no later than like the Monday, the Wednesday before so that we have a collection of what you want to consider and it needs to have all of the references and so forth to where it is, okay? So that if there's something like a lawnmower or a condominium or a whereas that you feel needs to go back in, that's, I do need that in advance, but I'll be asking you for that. I just want to let, give you the heads up now because some of you will be celebrating different holidays and maybe not paying attention. Alyssa. I was going to ask a couple of things and building off of what you said. I don't think anybody should bring us anything in January or you know, submit it to you on the Wednesday before that they haven't brought up tonight. Because right. in, right. you you read this a lot more before you got here tonight than you're going to read it again when right. you go home before the 6th. So that's the pro purpose of a first and second reading. is isn't so we all get surprised at the second reading. So I appreciate the specific on the lawnmower, and I understand that that one we went out on a bit of a limb associated with. I'm less comfortable with the condo thing because we know that that is not current state-of-the-art bylaw. We know it's old. We know it hasn't been used. We know that there are other variations out there. And so I would ask that for something like that rather than trying to stick it back in is that you say immediately I want the town council to ask GOL to go talk to somebody right. about giving us a new condo bylaw that provides the protections that I agree are very important protections but I think rather than putting in putting things back in in kind of a onesie twosie kind of way at this point the lawnmower being the exception feels like not a great way to deal with context. Let's start with it clean, but again, let's not for, lose sight of any of this stuff. I mean, some of the things that are on the list of things to do might not be very important to some of you, and the condo thing is, is important to a lot of us, and so let's make sure we get that referred and moved on 
but let's be able to accept the bylaw without saying, let's relitigate the whole condo thing here amongst a group of 13 who have literally never discussed it before. Right. That, that seems really awkward, whereas I think you could have a really effective conversation elsewhere with additional input from staff, et cetera. Thank you. So are there any other deletions, additions, changes? Yes, Mandy Jo. So I, I mentioned the lawnmower, but it means it doesn't, it doesn't I, I didn't do it clearly because I realized that many people might not know what I'm talking about. Um, so I'm going to clarify what that is. I'm trying to find it in the actual bylaw here. Page 30 something, 3.22, 3.34. So in unlawful noise bylaw, the 3.24, I will, and I will definitely send you the motion. It was on my list of things to do. I will likely ask to delete section A, A4 which in, is an added section that the bylaw review committee put into the current noise bylaw that is in the current bylaws that reads, that makes the noise bylaw that includes the loud disturbing, into the definition of loud disturbing injur, injurious or unnecessary noise, lawnmowers, leaf blowers, snow blowers, and other sim, similar mechanical devices. And I don't think I need to get into a discussion tonight. I'm not sure we want to get into why I want to do that, but. But the, the, my initial comment to the committee was that that seemed to me to be a significant addition to what unlawful noise applies as unlawful noise that maybe goes slightly beyond what this committee was actually tasked with doing and probably deserves its own discussion instead of being part of a wholesale rescind replace. Right. The, the other thing is that as these are raised, and I think Alyssa made a good point here, on, the, for example, the condominium thing that was struck, it's struck because it was pretty outdated, but maybe we do need something that is a condominium. Well, this will now go to GOL and changes, that kind of thing, where there's going to be more debate and maybe more research will happen within that committee and, and then come back to the council so that we're not sitting here trying to write bylaws. Okay? Yes, Bernie. Maybe if the council simply exempts electric lawnmowers, uh, it'll encourage uh, those of us who <laughs> to, uh, to either get goats or, uh, or, or to reduce our carbon footprint. I mean, just, just suggest. I don't, e I don't want to even get into this one. <laughs> we're not going to lawnmowers tonight. Uh, Evan, did you have another comment? Or someone over here had another comment? Okay. Yeah, I, yes, I just had I just had a clarification on a, and I, I understand now on co-op and condo, but are there other instances where it was a less than perfect by law wording and content that it was just wiped out because it wasn't great? You know, so it's, it's it, that was what kind of startled me when I read content pieces. I said, so did that, sh should I do a more careful reading on other things where it was just gone rather than fixed? Because my sense was throughout, you, you generally did great fixes. You know, you clarified, you moved things to places. Um, and this is the only one I saw where it, it completely went away and it wasn't like TIFF where you said maybe yes, maybe no, but we don't really need it, but you left it in. Okay, is there um, a comment? We, we consciously and deliberately left in some pretty bad stuff. Uh, stuff that we don't like. Okay. Uh, and there's <laughs> way more of that than there is taking out something uh, because we didn't like it. And okay. we never took it out for that reason. There always had to be some other explanation for why it was a vestigial tale and didn't deserve to be continued into the current code. Right. Okay. We, we explain that in the report, point by point, bylaw by bylaw. And, uh, but as I pointed out, and Bernie and I have both made this point clear, that we started off with something that was really imperfect. And what you, we are giving to you is something that's really imperfect, but less imperfect than what we started with. Uh, and we've put most of our energy into fixing what, what was easy to fix and identifying things that were more difficult to fix, that involve more policy considerations before action is taken which is a council prerogative and not a council uh, committee prerogative. So we, we did a lot, and it, we've given it to you to play around with. It's, it's right. clay in your hands. Right. Uh, you can change anything that we've recommended, uh, but this is our best thought on the topic. Right. Yeah. Are there any other comments from people at this time? 
now that you've been doing this for two years on behalf of the town of Amherst, thanks to both of you and to the rest of the committee as well for your work and we will continue our discussion on the 6th and hopefully not at this hour. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're moving on to 8D, the town manager goals. This is the first reading. Um, let me just mention that I don't think this group ever officially elected a chair. I think I was the coordinator, um, which meant basically I kept the documents going. Um, and then at one point, um, Kathy really took over and synthesized um, what we had into a document. I also want to say it does not particularly concern me that this is only the first reading, even though we are now in the end of December or middle of December. And that is because Mr. Bachman has been part of many of our meetings. And so everything that is in this document, he's seen, we've talked with him about, we've talked about whether it's actionable, whether it's measurable, et cetera. And so it's not like he's flying blind, but we would like to have a conversation about it tonight. There's no vote tonight. It will come back on the 2nd, I mean, on the 6th of at 2020. And uh, with that, Kathy, I asked Kathy actually to manage this conversation. Uh, do you have other comments you wanna make? Um, no, I just, you all have s seen the draft and I just wanna say a little bit of uh, to add to what Lynn said about our thinking as we w went into this, um, we wanted to think about the end point when we're doing an evaluation on how did we do and tried, although we didn't succeed in making this a lot shorter, um, conceptually what we had in mind is around large, bold, or main headers would be where we would do come some kind of rating, great job, got half the way there, you know. And then some of the others could be, it happened or it didn't happen, you know, just a much more simple. So for example, on Roman numeral one of strong physical management, ensuring that this happens, A, we would be rating, we wouldn't necessarily be rating every item underneath it. It would be more a guideline on the, how many of these things happened. So do we think this was an over the top job? So the at the end, we would be more able to have a general sense of how we thought things went. Then the other um, pieces just of note here are we elevated climate action to its own topic. Um, so in big bold and, you know, we, we mentioned the words climate action more than once and there was actually some discussion of mentioning it three or four times, but it's, it's there. As, as an overarching way of thinking about when we make the next purchase, when we uh, worry about a new building, when we, you know, name whatever, the when we have it, have it be in people's minds that we, we want to pay attention to this. Um, so that's why it went to the higher level of, rather than just embedding it in, when you think about the budget, when you think about this, it was more. So we, we elevated that to its own topic, although it permeates everything. Then on long-term planning, as well as the beginning, we tried to identify things that people have raised as concerns that we want to at least hear report back. So on the first, so let me not quite jump around, on the first on financial and sustainable, we want to be taking a hard look at, are there opportunities to get more efficient, more cooperative ways of working so that we can lower our operating costs. But are there areas, for example, fire and EMT, which we should really be looking at, are we staffed adequately? And so we've, we've raised it to the level of we want to have a look at that and come back to us with a yes, no, what. So we tr tried to pick up on things we've been hearing all year round and make it something that uh, people wanted focus on. So in long-term planning, similarly, I, I mentioned earlier tonight on 
We've authorized the purchase of Hickory Ridge. Let's not delay forever the plan on what we're going to do with it. You know, be thinking about it. So we put some pieces in long term that not necessarily it has been done in the next year, but we've at least started to focus on it and we get a report back. Um, on personnel management, um, you can see what's here. The expanding community engagement, we, and I noticed our letter numbering fell off here, Lynn, so it should start with an A, B, C, and we can okay. fix that underneath that. But in each of these, we tried to say it's, it's community engagement, and let's talk about how well we're doing, what else we've done to bring the community in, what's our relationship with the higher education institutions. We tried to group things so that they went together. So we used a lot of what had been in last year's evaluation and just moved things into categories. So they're not necessarily in the same place. Um, and uh, we put the relationship to the town council last, but not least, um, because we think we're off to a, a really good start. But the most important thing in our minds is that getting the town running well uh, thinking about the future was what our aspirational goals are, and we want the town manager, and we, then he want us, we, we want the way he's working with us to work well to make all of the above. So I, th I think I'll just stop there, but to give you a sense of that was, we're thinking when we hit July and August, and we're looking at these, that we can come back to the high level and say, how well did we do on these? Did, was it a good start? Did we get a lot of the way? and we can have our checklist of these things happened or didn't, um, and try to make them actionable, as Lynn said. You know, would we know whether it happened or not? Um, so some things where we thought we, we liked the idea, but we have no idea of, you know, are people happy campers everywhere? Is teamwork working well? So we tried to get things that we could say, we've got some baseline, and we have some way of knowing about it. And and focused on those, and I will stop there. Okay, comments. Yes, Evan. So thank you for this document. Um, I think that in many ways, um, the way we organize things in this document is signaling to the town manager what we think his priorities should be. Um, and in that way, I think it's great that we pulled climate action out as something to signal to the town manager that we want to make sure you're using a lens of climate action. Um, but I think there are other things that probably should also be singled out. And one of the things that threw me in this is in all of these bullets and, and everything, there's uh, economic development appears in 3F in one little line that just says economic development. And to me, um, all of the things we want to do around climate action all of the things we want to have within strong fiscal management require some level of economic development. And so to have just one little thing on it um, to, that just vaguely says identify strategies that build on this report um, is insufficient. And so I would, I, I would like to see economic development actually be its own category, and I'd like to see some actual objectives under that um, that, that, that pair with that. I think some of these things could be moved there. Um, but I think that you know, it, the words business, commercial, growth appear nowhere in this document. And I think they're all really important for us to achieve what we want. Um, and, and certainly, the council didn't do much with economic development in its first year. It did a whole lot on climate. It did a decent amount on housing. It did nothing on economic development. It was my hope that we could uh, try to emphasize that in the year ahead. OK. Other comments? Andy. So I guess the first thing I'm going to say uh, is thank you to the committee because I think it is really a good piece of um, work and obviously a monumental effort. The one thing that concerns me always, and this goes back to my um, select board experience too, is that we create a, a list of expectations that become so long that it's really impossible for anybody to imagine how anybody could do it. Now, of course, um, our town manager works with a large staff, and not all of it is done by the town manager. Some of it is delegated, and it's a question of making sure that somebody's following up on it. But 
there always was, it struck me, and I think I probably said it a few times in the select board over the years, that um, we have to be careful that we don't get a walk on water in there because uh, you can really put anything in. Um, having said that, there were several things that I thought about that I was curious why the committee didn't consider or maybe they didn't consider them. Um, and uh, so it's sort of backwards from what I just said. And my suggestion would be that uh, since this is first reading, that we set up a mechanism where we can send back to the committee what those are as opposed to trying to list them tonight because the answer may come back. Uh, we thought about it and it was really stupid or thank you for your comment. We think it's really stupid, but uh, at least uh, it gives us a place to go without uh, prolonging this meeting another uh, half an hour or more. Okay. I, I think that's a very approachable idea. Um, I think the challenge for the goals um, committee, ad hoc committee is going to be meeting between now and the 6th, but we'll do everything we can. Um, are there other comments that people want to make at this point or just wait and ask for solicitation? Yes, Alyssa. So I know that when you look at something for a really long time, things don't always still scan the way you intend to. And so since this is based on previous work, it is not made up out of whole cloth. Um, I'm concerned because I think something got lost in translation. Under item 1B2, conduct strategic departmental reviews as needed, focus on staffing and systems. This just sounds like generic business school 1981 or something. I, I, I'm not sure what you meant by that, and so I would just ask you to go back and look in your notes and see what it is that you were trying to get across there because he could very easily say, we didn't need any strategic departmental reviews, and I always focus on staffing and systems. So I, some of these are really concise and easy for us to figure out how we're going to use them in an evaluation instrument, but maybe some of the others just slipped a little. And so maybe take, try and take another look, thinking about what that instrument's going to look like at the end, because it's not going to look like that Google form again, because that was a disaster. So, um, but some kind of form where, and be thinking about, do you want people to rate just A and B, or do you want them to rate one, two, three, four, five, six, or, you know, so, um, but overall, aside from missing the economic development thing, and that one just jumped out at me as like, I don't know where that came from. Um, I appreciate the trying to be more concise. Okay, additional comments, Evan. Just it, is there a particular reason why this has to be adopted on the 6th as opposed to the 2nd? No, it's just that we're already halfway through the year. <laughs> Other, than that. Other than that, you know, it's like, hello. <laughs> we can, I mean, we'll do what we can. And if we, if we can't, it, then it waits till the 27th. And then we're <laughs> five, seven twelfths through the year. <laughs> yes, Dorothy. Um, what I'd be interested in seeing from people is what you think can be cut. My concern, besides trying to you know, put together this document, was to not be so micromanaging. I, I just feel this is just on top of them, like, oh, do this, do that, do this. And um, I, I think that's difficult. And I think it would be kind of hard to work under. So um, if you, as any way to kind of get rid of some of the things I think would be good. Okay. Mandy Joe. So I did mine in a track changes document that I can forward to whoever's been facilitating Thank documents. You. Um, but I did want to talk about, to try and limit the amount of time I talk, number three, the long-term planning, C and D, um, was some of, you know, C, the begin to develop a five-year plan, I kind of want a five-year plan that's logical, not just beginning to. Because beginning to means we might hit the end of this fiscal year and still not have that five-year plan that's logical um, for the capital investments. Um, and D was also begin to develop a plan to improve downtown public infrastructure, parks, and spaces. I read that and I said, I thought we already had 
one in, in sort of concept. So I wasn't sure what would go on with that one um, in addition to what we already have with a Kendrick Park and a, and a town North Common and it, there seemed to be things already there. The, there was one, I, and then there were two others I wanted to mention. In 4B5, the respond to health and safety concerns in a timely manner, I just wasn't sure what that meant to meant in terms of improved customer services to residents and businesses. Um, so some explanation would be helpful on that one. And then under five, expand community engagement, what would become A2, it's now F2, um, report annually on community participation officers activities and recommendations. So the charter section 3.3D, little number six, says that the community participation officers must regularly submit reports to the town manager and town council. So I kind of see this one as setting forth something that's already required in the charter, um, and we're not doing that with any other required charter action. So what is this one specifically? But the charter says the CPOs do it, not that the manager does it. So is this something in addition to what the CPOs are doing? Is it not? So I would ask you to look at that one and think more about that one with respect to what the charter actually requires. Okay. And I trust that along with your track changes, you also have comments. Yeah, Thank you. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions at this point that people want to bring forward? I'm sorry, Pat. I, I actually want to ask Paul, what do you think of the document? Seriously. Or not. <laughs> Please, Paul, go ahead. <laughs> So um, I, I was. Yeah, you know, are there issues for you? Yeah, so I was grateful that the committee invited me to comment on it, and we did. Uh, a lot of the things that you've identified, there were conversations in the committee okay. about those items. Um, for me, I wanted, I thought it was important that the, uh, there are over 50 goals here. It's, it's a lot. Um, I thought the goal should be clear, measure, you know, smart goals, clear, measurable, and achievable. Uh, some of the things that you're identifying, I would not be able to commit in six months to be able to achieve them. So I won't, I would recommend or ask that the council not put those in or put in begin to type comments. Just looking at what else is on our plate for the next six months because that's the time frame that you're really going to be uh, measuring. I thought it was important for these goals that it not be a document just for the town manager, but it's really a document for the public. Typically, you, the council would set its goals. And then those from your goals would flow my goals. Now we don't have time, we didn't have time to do that. So we're starting with this because there's a little time, more time urgency. Um, so I think this is gonna be the document that's gonna be out in the public. So it should be communicating your values to the public. So I think that that's having these big bold things there highlighted. I think there are also things that you should be able to say without a second thought. You should be able to say, what are the town manager's goals? You'd be able to tick them off, you know, the top three or four on the top of your head. You, you shouldn't have to look at a piece of paper to say, here's what they are. The public wants to, I think, wants to know what are your expectations of me and to be able to articulate that because if you can do it and I can do it and I can communicate that down in pretty straightforward language to the full staff, um, that will be a powerful message throughout the organization. So that's why I think having climate action called out is a, is a special thing, was an important thing because if that's the goal of the council, that's going to be my goal, and it will be the goal of the town staff as well as we move forward. Um, so um, I, I think the sort of bottom line is they should be easy to understand, and you should be able to, it, they should be pretty straightforward to, to know if it's been done or not. That's really where you want to be in nine months when you, or eight months whenever, whenever you start looking at the performance. You say, did he get it done or not? And it should be obvious um, or you know, within, within some shades of obvious. So I think these are pr pretty solid. Um, I think, you know, obviously I would have things differently, but it's really the council's document, not mine. Thank you. Are there, a, yes, Just Lisa. one more quick remark, and again, I'll try and look at this too in terms of, I think, I mean, we could probably all rewrite different sections, and I'm sure it's fine, it's fine. I'm just thinking more about what the evaluation instrument's going to look like at the end in terms of us all having the same expectations. We had a lot of it. conversation and about that. That'll be that. the exciting part. Yeah. Um, but I, I do just want to push back a little bit on something the town manager said, which was that it's not up to us to have town council goals. That's absolutely not 
true. It's not been true in this town. That was not true with the select board. We have goals for the town manager because he is our one employee and we don't have executive authority to do basically anything. So I can personally have a goal about economic development, which is all really well and cool, but unless I can convince all of you to tell the town manager to do something about it, I can't do jack about economic development. So it's not my goal, it's our goal for him and that's why I really have talked about at the retreat before. These goals are the important goals, our own council goals that we might wanna talk about some minor things that will help us function better, awesome. But these are the important ones and they are our goals for the community and he is our way of implementing those. But we're not gonna develop like a whole nother set of town council goals out of which these grew. These are our goals. Are there other comments? All right, then you'll be receiving an email I made the minor changes about the numbering, and that's all. I did not make comments on this, but you'll be receiving an email, and you will be asked not to respond as a group, but to provide feedback just to me. Okay? Thank you. Um, and we, committee members on there. Huh? I think you should add the committee members and the team will introduction using the words you know, smart goals or measurable attainable. All right. It was, uh, Darcy was giving some suggestions about some pre-items pre, pre I might put on there. Okay, given that. Um, I said Darcy. Dorothy is doing it this time. I'm sorry. All right, do you need a break at this point? Yes. No, just keep moving. All right. Uh, we are going to 7B, which is, if you need to. Okay, we're going on to 7B, which is the out OCA's appointment process. And I'm calling on Evan at this point. Do, yes. Do we actually need a recess? I'm not comfortable with starting this with anybody out of the room. Nope, I'm not. Well then we'll wait. Anybody else need to? Take a break. We're taking a silent break. All right. It's G, the ten five H thing. First reading. <laughs> F, this is G. rules of procedure. Yeah. But the amendments to rule 10.5H oh. regarding public comment, first reading. All right, let's go with that, George. Evan. Evan. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'll start talking. Um, so what we're going to start talking about, I believe, when Dorothy returns is the uh, process adopted by OCA that OCA will be using to develop its recommendations to the town council regarding appointments to multiple member bodies appointed by the town council. Uh, those of you who read uh, the report will note that those, uh, that process now involves public interviews. Um, those public interviews will of course be posted public meetings, but there is a, an interest, and I believe this is one of the areas where there is consensus within OCA, um, that those public meetings should not include public comment. Uh, we have real concerns about having public comment at interviews uh, because the interviews will be the sole agenda item, and so the only thing people would be able to comment on would be the interviews. Um, and we certainly don't want a situation where we have public commenters um, offering critiques or potentially disparaging comments about people who just interviewed. Um, and so we, we, we are hoping to um, prohibit public comment during those. However, the current language of Rule 10.5H does not permit us to do that. It just says committee meet, I don't have it in front of me, but I believe it says committee meeting shall provide for a period of public comment, um, which means we don't necessarily have the option of not having public comment. So OCA is seeking a rule change um, to add the word regular in front of committee meetings 
to specify that regular committee meetings shall provide for a period of public comment. What that allows us to do is to schedule the interviews as a special meeting and then we have the discretion as to whether or not we want to include public comment. This is uh, this language parallels the charter language. As, as you'll note in the charter, it says regular meetings of the town council shall provide for a period of public comment. Um, that allows us to not have public comment at special meetings. Um, and so this would just bring the language around public comment at committee meetings into conformity with the language of the charter around town council meetings and allow us to schedule interviews um, without having to deal with public comment. Just, just from a process thing, I will say, uh, for, because of timing, um, OCA is bringing this for the first reading. Today, it has not been considered by GOL, but it is on GOL's agenda for their meeting on, on uh, Wednesday. And so with the hope that we could have a GOL report, a second reading, and a vote at the January 6th meeting. Are there any questions? Oh, Dorsey. Um, I just wondered if we should maybe refine the language more to say uh, like a particular type of special meeting because do we want to exempt all special meetings from public comment? Um, that seems overly broad. I can see the I see the reason why we should do this, but um, but to take public comment out of all special meetings might not be that might be in. Yeah. If you read if you write it so that it says that public comment is required at all regular meetings, that does not exclude it from special meetings. It just doesn't require it at special right. meetings. Right, the question is, do we want to require it at special meetings except special meetings involving interviews or something like that? Okay, yes, Kathy. I, I, I was going somewhat in that direction because we have had some meetings that have, we've called as special meetings of the council that we've always we, we assume we would do public comment. So I, what I'm wondering is, I under, I'm not disagreeing that it, it would be good to not have them. Can we do something either very surgical that, you know, during interviews we wouldn't take special comments? Or can we waive the special comment rule for these instances? Because we can waive a, a rule when we want to because it, it seems like it's being written too broadly um, regular is an ad hoc meeting so my little percent for art we had public comment on it no one no public ever came but we just routinely put it up put it as part of our agenda so I, I'm worried it's too broad if we just put the word regular Steve's got Steve yeah so I have a broader question so we don't know when the special meetings will be posted they might be posted the same night as a regular meeting so what prevents a person who wants to public comment about candidates to do it at a public comment period at a regular? So in other words, if the, it's posted that there will be these interviews and the who these being interviewed is, and people are gaming the system, can't speak at the special meeting. I'll speak at the meeting, the regular meeting, and try to influence. I think the surgical approach, and I'm sorry, I've lost track of who said that, that we should just say that we won't accept public comments on issues regarding the elections of our officers. Personnel and appointments. Personnel issues. That was getting at my more surgical, more surgical tar targeted here. Alyssa. So that's a super nice theory, but it's illegal. So good luck with that. You can't control the content of public comment. Right. We've tried in the past. We did not get taken to court for it, and it made everybody's life much happier. But there have been court cases done in the last couple of years. So you can't have a thing that says you can't talk about candidates. That, that's just not a thing. So the only way to prevent is to not have public comment. And let's remember that this idea of special and regular meetings is a totally made up thing by the Charter Commission. And so 
if we call something, reflecting first back to what Lynn said, if it's, you know, if it's a regular meeting, you're gonna have it. If you call it a special meeting, we don't call, we don't call most things special meetings. We try and, regular doesn't just mean we publish the calendar six months ahead. There's no rule that says what regular means. That's just a, a, a concept we have. So if we call, if we say a special meeting doesn't require public comment, then we know if we call it a special meeting, then we're safe from public comment. That doesn't mean that we wouldn't want to have some special meeting sometime that for some reason we called it a special meeting, but we were still going to have public comment. I don't know why we'd call that meeting a special meeting, but, you know, conceivably something could happen. But regular doesn't have a real meaning in real life, and neither does special. So we're trying to make them mean these things in this case to track with what the charter says about regular meetings. It does not define what regular means, but it talks about regular meetings when it comes to public comment. Can I suggest that, it's, unless there's any more comment, that this now is going to go back to GOL? And they've been here hearing the comment today and see what you come back with. Yes? Okay. We're going back to Um, outreach, this is under presentation and discussions, there's no vote. It's OCA's process for reviewing and recommending candidates for ZBA and planning board. Evan. Thank you. So, um, as, as we all know, part of OCA's charge is making recommendations on appointments to multiple member bodies appointed by the town council. Really that applies to just three bodies, uh, the planning board, the ZBA, and the non-voting resident members of the finance committee at current, in, unless one of the people on ranked choice voting or participatory budgeting that was a council appointment resigns. Um, we're really just talking about three bodies. Uh, so. OCA's in, uh, part of OCA's charge is, is recommending those appointments, and so OCA has to figure out what is the process through, our co through which our committee comes to those recommendations to bring those recommendations to the full town council. The appointment, of course, is by the council, but the recommendation is by OCA, and so we needed to develop the process through which we come to that recommendation. We developed the process last spring. You all probably remember that. Um, it was successful in that we got appointments to the planning board, the ZBA, and several other committees, um, but it was also uh, not without flaws. And so OCA has spent the past eight meetings, I believe, eight meetings, um, discussing how to revise that process to respond to some of the critiques we heard um, from the council. Uh, I'm not going to go into details about that process because you have, I assume, already read it. Uh, we sent a preview of the process to the full town council on December 4th and asked for feedback. Several of you responded. Thank you to those of you who responded. That feedback was very useful. Um, we had a meeting in which we discussed that feedback and then we adopted the process at our meeting on December 9th. Um, the process is in the report along with a very detailed discussion of the deliberations behind that process, uh, the responses to the feedback we received. Um, and so, you know, what I think we're looking for tonight is just to apprise you of what the process is um, and also to hear uh, sort of any last minute feedback as we move into the implementation phase of this process. Uh, I do want to stress that the opinion of the majority of OCA is that this is an internal OCA process. Uh, we worked very hard to make sure that everything within the process exists wholly within the realm of OCA. So there is nothing in the process that requires action by the town council. There's nothing on the process that imposes any type of burden or restriction on the town council. Um, it is the process through which the committee develops its recommendation that it then brings to the council. Um, and so 
we even had removed sections of the of the process that were in there originally that sort of exceeded that scope and and touched on the actions of the town council to make sure that this was really a committee process um, and so we're not looking for a vote on this process, uh, it, just in the way that we don't look for a vote on the internal workings of any of the committees of the council. Um, but we are interested in your feedback because we will be bringing to you at some point our recommendations for appointments. Um, and of course, we wanna make sure that you're confident in those recommendations and one of those, uh, part of that confidence relies on confidence in the process through which we came to those recommendations. So I'd like to separate the feedback and conversation in the council to two things. One is any comments about the general process. The second one, which we'll take up after we're done with the first, is the issue that I know a couple councilors have raised to me, and that is, is this exclusively an OCO process or does the council need to vote on it? So let's stick with the first one. Questions about the process? Kathy. Okay, um, it's a question, comment, concern, so in that category. Um, uh, if I'm reading correctly, you're proposing to do a group interview of the entire group of applicants all at one time period. So presumably, let's assume all five OCA people are there. Um, and there could be six applicants and they're all in the room. Number one, I can understand that might be efficient in terms of counselor time, but it is a very bizarre dynamic for applicants. And I've been, in my lifetime, had to hire people or appoint people. And people's styles vary so much that it, um, and we're, we're talking about planning, let me just focus on planning and zoning, where you want, there are gonna be some people that are the thoughtful, quieter people, that you need them to give them a little bit of time to get their words out, but they have so much to say if you can do that, if they're side by side with someone who's glib and easy to present, and that person said almost everything they were gonna say. They can say, me too, or ditto in a group thing, which will be a very, you wouldn't get any feeling of, did they, was that their idea? If we give everyone the questions in advance and you're gonna put them all up there and ask the same questions, on some level we could just send them the questionnaire, have them write their paragraphs. <laughs> you know, because there's no individualization at all going on there, you know, and uh, a bit the way when we ran for council, you know, we got some good questionnaires and you could see what we thought and make some judgments. So I think the notion of a group interview of a group is not basically not a good idea. So that's number one. Um, because particularly it's this, and I know there are some people that you have to say, could you tell us a little bit more? You, you just need to get them to open up. They don't have a style that comes in chatting. Number two, is that you're proposing that because it's one interview with everyone at the same time, if someone can't make that date, it just doesn't work. They're gone, they're not an applicant anymore. So one of the criteria for applicants becomes you have to be available the day we're meeting, which is a very bizarre <laughs> criteria for someone for a planning or zoning board. Um, suppose there's a death in the family or four months in advance, I do think it's reasonable to ask any candidate, can they meet at the time the committee's meeting? You know, will you generally be available Tuesday nights? But to eliminate someone, and that goes with the first, that if you want to interview everyone at the same time, you can't make an exception for one person and interview them at a separate time. So I don't think someone should be eliminated because they can't make your date. My third concern is different. Um, as I read it, one person, the chair, would do every interview. Um, I think styles vary, tone varies, body language varies, and if you're gonna have a group from OPA, I would rotate whoever's designated as the person to ask the questions, because you actually learn from different people 
as they ask questions. When we, I've been on interview teams with three or four of us, we designated a lead for each of them. And some people had a style that just brought more out of people and others didn't. And I, I think you could if you're worried about five people having to do six interviews at six different times, it's a lot of time. You could say at least three OCA people have to be there. Everyone is, should be there for all of them, but not everyone has to be there for all of them. That would give you a way of rotating the chair. So I'm, I'm concerned with those three parts of the proposal. I didn't mind it being a public interview. I, I liked this I, solution that people came up with. But I thought the group interview of a group uh, was one of the more the bigger oddities I've seen, for, particularly for this kind of position, where we're not picking someone who's just a show person who needs to perform well. And it's it's a thoughtful, analytic kind of uh, position that we'd be putting people in. Rather than respond, I'm going to suggest that if others have comments, they do that, and then we collect response. Okay. Yes, Dorothy. I find some of the things here a little bit schizophrenic. The candidates are so delicate that their CAFs cannot be made public, although we're told that in Northampton they are public and listed. Yet those same people will do well in a group interview. Um, you know, I'm an extrovert. I can handle a group interview. But we all know that a good committee has got people who are of different types. And I can see some people saying, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to sit there once they hear what it's like. I also don't like the inability to do a follow-up question. There's just no individuation. Um, and if you happen to be the third person to be asked the same identical question and everybody else has said all the good stuff, you're going to feel pretty left out. So I, I, I just don't like the group interview, and I think the CAF should be public. Additional comments on the process. Well, point of order, I just wanted just to say that saying that something is schizophrenic is incredibly ableist, and I realize that I just, I don't think words like that should be used, although I do understand to a certain point what you were trying to convey. Thank you. Thank you for your correction. Um, are there additional comments on the process? Yes, Darcy. Um, I, uh, I'm a member of OCA, as you all know. Uh, I voted against disclosing the CAFs only 48 hours before the interviews um, because I believe we should make our application process totally transparent. I, 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 when, I, when it became clear that we were going to have a public interview, it, I just kind of assumed that we were going to open up the this whole CAF process and make it completely transparent. Um, and I really do feel like we should do the same thing that Northampton does. Instead of holding them until 48 hours before the interview, allow them to be public, go immediately on application, be posted on the website like they are in Northampton. Then anyone who wants to can go Look, see who's applied, how many people have applied, look at the CAF, see what the qualifications are, and make a determination about whether they want to apply. You know, they, they can see uh, from the pool whether they might be needed, uh, whether there's already people there that would um, have their same point of view so they don't feel like they are needed. So maybe they won't apply. But it definitely is a way for people to find out whether they should apply by having it available to the public immediately upon application. So this is, of course, a problem that I've had all along, and I um, really hope that we can get to a point of finally doing that. Um, I also think that we, it doesn't, matter that we have applicants that already have applied and they didn't check off the checkoff box because we could simply ask them directly and uh, or we, we can provide them with forms that they can check off. Um, so that does not seem to me to be a problem at all with this round of applications. I had problems with a lot of 
other parts of the of the process, but you saw that in the report, so I'll just let you read about those. Steve. Yeah, so I agree with everyone. <laughs> um, but I, so actually the thoughtful analytical part, so the, these are, the zoning board and the, the um, planning board definitely requires the, you know, a range of personality types, but these are also political positions. So you also have to be able to operate in the, you know, the public realm. You have to convince other people in an open meeting that, you know, that the position that you're advocating for is, you know, a worthy cause. So, so, so that part of it's really important. So I don't see a group interview any different or not that much different than the kinds of things that we went through. I was trying to remember who sponsored the last debate of the counselors, but in a sense that was a group interview. We were all asked the same question. We went right down right. the line and we answered it in our own, you know, our particular styles. And if we chose to defer to someone else or to repeat what somebody else had said, that's fine. But it was, it was a form of group interview. Additional comments, Andy. Yeah. As far as the group interview process, um, my experience was back on the select board when there was a vacancy on an elected board it was a group interview with the select board and the remaining members of the board that had the vacancy. And the process was uh, virtually the same as what is being proposed here. And it actually did work. And I thought it had served a lot of good purposes um, because uh, we did alternate uh, who was getting the question first so that not everybody would have the benefit of going first, you'd, you'd rotate the order. We also took turns on, so that everybody got an opportunity to ask a question. But the, but the, the whole feel of the group interview um, did not, in my experience, discourage anybody from applying for any of those positions. And I thought that it enabled us to really um, contrast in one setting all of the people it was an efficient process which if we're going to be uh, as counselors invited to observe the process uh, to go to multiple meetings is probably going to discourage any of us from doing that uh, so I based on my select board experience and having done those for uh, numbers of different boards and committees where we were select, electing a person, I would support the basic concept. Additional comments? Shalini. So I went in thinking that group interviews didn't make sense, but as you all by now probably know, my default is to do research. And I did find actually that there were benefits to doing def uh, group interviews where you get to see the dynamic of the people and how they are sort of, you know, vis-a-vis -vis each other. I, know, I understand there's not going to be a communication amongst the people, but it still feels like you would be able to assess how they are. So there seems to be a positive to that. Um, and as far as introverts are concerned, I think they're capable of answering in a group setting. It's just that they may not, if there was, you know, this seems like it's very structured. If an introvert is asked a question in a group directly, they will be able to answer. It's just they may not, if there are 100 people, they may not raise their hand. But I don't think it's going to be, because I happen to be an introvert, and I think it'll be fine. Um, I still would like, I don't know when we will get a response, but I'm still not clear about the benefits of keeping our um, stuff calves. Um, private. I'm still not, I'm still on the fence about that and I'm not sure I've received enough information from OCA convincing me that that's the best way to go. Okay. In Mindy So I just want to thank OCA for actually soliciting advice from the counselors on an internal process. I think that was very nice of you. Um, I'll respond to Shalini's question that also Darcy brought up. There are studies out there, and, and it's tangentially related, that show that in a job application setting, when you put requirements down, men, and if that requirement is must have this, 
must have that. Men who don't have that are more likely to reply, apply for that job, but the women will read that, and if they don't fit any of it, they won't apply. And so you get an applicant, you know, an applicant pool that has women who are overqualified and men who are underqualified. So I would, <laughs> I would worry that if you actually published CAFs, we don't put out their qualifications per se, but you could get someone that reads someone's CAF that has already applied and said, oh my gosh, I don't have a shot at all. And that person might actually be the person you want, but they won't apply because they might see the qualifications and just assume that that's exactly what we're looking for. And we might actually get less diverse applicants, less um, applicants from maybe tangentially related areas that we're actually looking to put on a finance committee, a planning board, or a ZBA. And so I would worry that publishing them in advance of an interview or at, while we're still actively ac accepting applications might actually harm our ability to get diverse candidates, which is what our real goal is. Additional comments? Okay, this has been comments on the process and actually it's also been on CAFs. Any other comments with regard to those? Okay, and Steve. Yeah, so one thing I forgot to comment on is what if you can't make the group interview date? So I wouldn't make it a fatal flaw if you can't make the interview just in the same way that if you can't make the debate or whatever, you're still a candidate. But I would make, maybe the interviews aren't mandatory, maybe they're optional. Maybe there's a rain date, you know, if, if you simply can't make it. Okay. Sure. All right, bear with me, because you all, you all said some different things. Um, so I'm going to start with the easiest one, which is just a correction to one of Kathy's comments. Uh, so our language is, OCA will ask the adopted interview questions of the group. Um, that was kept intentionally vague, and so the committee could decide whether all of the committee members will alternate asking questions, or whether just the chair would, or maybe just one member would, but it's not the chair. Um, I, think, I think that we wanted to keep it somewhat flexible, and so um, it's not written anywhere in the policy that the chair is the one asking the questions. It says OCA will ask the questions to keep it broad. Um, regarding the date, uh, you know, that's certainly a tough one that we discussed. Um, where, where we came down on was the idea that it's not like we're, at least under the current process, we're not going to say, all interviews are going to be held on January 25th, and if you can't make January 25th, you're out. The idea would be that we would work with the applicants to find a date that works with all of them. Um, and you know, I know in my experience, uh, being the person for rank choice voting, uh, we were able to do that. We interviewed everyone on on the same day. Um, it certainly takes some. There's a logistical challenge there, um, but the idea, at least at current, was never to just say, here's the date, and if you can't make it, the idea would be to, the date would come out of the availability of the people who applied. Um, whether or not we, you know, uh, need, whether or not you can still be in the pool um, if you don't do the interviews, I think the question with that becomes that sort of an unfair advantage to either someone who didn't or did interview. Um, group interviews, you know, one thing I want to say about that is we had a very lengthy discussion about group versus individual. And what we found was just in OCA, some people went, oh my God, a group interview? That sounds awful. I would never do that. And some people said, oh my God, an individual interview where I'm sitting right there and the committee's here and the public there and I'm all by myself? That sounds awful. I would never do that. And what we realized is that everyone is different and that there's no people-friendly solution that works for everyone as long as the interviews are public. Uh, my preference would be individual interviews in private, but we couldn't do that. Um, and what where I, I started with individual interviews being my preference and where I got to group interviews 
was the idea that they are public interviews and we want to make sure there's consistent experience about, around candidates. So what would make me feel uncomfortable is if someone came in and did their interview and there was an empty room and then all of a sudden six members of the public came in and the next person having to interview had to do it but there's members of the public behind them. That, that creates, there's a different environment that seems unfair and so I think I ended up coming down um, on the side of consistency more than anything um, and, and you know, I think Kathy noted that it was a very strange format, um, but I think Andy sort of got my response, which is this isn't a new format. This isn't something that we invented. Um, this is, is, is very heavily based on the process used to fill a vacancy on elected body. And so this is something that the town is already used to because it's been done before. Um, with regard to CAFs, um, I think that there is a much larger conversation to have around community activity forms. Uh, I think that conversation should start in OCA, but I think that's a conversation that should come to the full town council uh, at some point in time. Um, I, am, I am very rigid in my belief that we should not change our policy mid-process. I don't believe it's as simple as reaching out to the people who already submitted and saying, would you be okay with this being released publicly even though you submitted it under the assumption that it wouldn't be? Um, and then what do you do if someone says no? Are they now out of the pool if they don't want their CAF released publicly? Or do we just keep theirs private? The, I think the simplest and cleanest solution is to maintain the policy and have a larger discussion about CAFs because I think one of the things we all realized from the last appointment process was that the CAFs aren't always all that useful. And we should probably be having a bigger conversation about how to make CAFs useful, and right. that's where right. that debate about whether they're public or documents or personnel records logically falls, not midway through a process when people have already submitted them under a different assumption. Uh, the last thing I want to say, because I think that I've addressed everything else, was about releasing um, sort of CAFs and numbers. Um, and, you know, I think that there's, there's reasons too, but I think that a few people have hinted on some of the reasons not to release CAFs publicly, release numbers or release names in advance, um, which is one of the goals, one of my personal goals that I think is shared by many members of this council is to try to get people um, involved in our government who haven't been before. And I think that um, releasing names, releasing CAFs, I think that can actually diminish those prospects. And I think it actually um, benefits people who have confidence um, because they've been involved in these things before. And I, and I, I shared a story with Oka that I actually want to share uh, with the full council, which was when I was deciding whether or not to run for office. I was someone who had no experience previously in, in town government. Um, I thought maybe I had something to contribute. And I, and I debated for a while. And I went to see who had pulled papers. And, I, and I, first I saw the name Steve Schreiber on there. And I said, well, I don't know who Steve Schreiber is. So I looked him up and I go, oh, he's the chair of the planning board. Okay, so he, he's been in this community, he has some authority. And then I saw the name Niels LaCour on there. And so I looked up Niels LaCour's name, and I, because I didn't know him either, because I don't know any of you people. <laughs> And I looked at Neil LaCour's name and I went, oh, well, he's, he's been involved with the town, he's at UMass. And I thought, I can't win this race. These are people with deep ties in the community. They have experience in our local government. There's no way that I would win the race over these people. And I decided not to run. And then I told my roommate, and he said, that's stupid. I won't be friends with you anymore if you don't at least try. And so I did it. But I came very close to not running because I was intimidated by the names and the qualifications of the other people in the race. And I think that you, we have to think about if you release numbers, if you release CAFs, if you release names in advance, that, that becomes a possibility. And so the opposite of what Dorothy said, uh, or Darcy, um, about... D Dorothy said it in a comment. Darcy said it tonight. They both said it. They both said it. They both said it, which is the possibility that someone might see people and say, oh, well, I, I have something to contribute. The opposite is also true. And to me, if we're trying to break down barriers to entry, we want to make sure that we're not accidentally erecting okay. them. All right. Thank you. So there is a second part to this conversation. And that is the issue of whether or not people believe that OCA, as a standing committee of the council, has the right to develop and adopt a procedure that does not come to the council. Comments? Kathy. Um, I see this as 
very different than just an internal process. Um, I think it is, uh, we made a decision to de delegate the interviews, um, but getting to a comfort level of the process, I think we should be willing to vote on it, and then we can be held accountable and we're responsible for it. So it really makes us do it. So I, I, I would like you to come back with whatever revisions you're comfortable with. And I went back to think, what did we do in April when we had that incredibly long meeting? And the plea at that point was because the process of figuring out a way to do an interview had taken so long, and we were at April 1st, and we needed a planning board and zoning, said, let us just try this. Don't bring this back to a vote right now. Let's see how this works. Because if you want us to change it and come back and get a vote, we'll never be able to do these interviews. So we said, let's try it. And it's being revised now because it was tried. We gave you comments. So I, I, think, I don't see it why it's different than our rules of procedure, why how we conduct things at a meeting. Because um, this is us choosing particularly these two boards. These are regulatory boards. And we should be really, really comfortable with the process. Um, I think we're pretty close to saying go ahead with it. But I, I don't see it as purely an internal process and just go ahead. Because if I felt that someone didn't get interviewed or were excluded from my, my worry about that, it's a fatal flaw, you didn't make the interview, and I found out someone was ready, they just couldn't do that date, I would feel we hadn't been fair. And I'm, I'm responsible for not being fair then, because I said okay to that process. So I think we should get a comfort level with a process, and the only way I see it is it comes back and we vote on it. Um, we, we were pretty unanimous on almost every rule of procedure. There wasn't a lot of dissension, but to be stepping away from something as important as our planning and zoning board, way we work with the people who might want to serve what is a really difficult job. Um, it's a volunteer position, but it's a lot of time, thought, and energy. So that's my, I think this is a policy, not just a nice one-off internal process that's similar to the Finance Committee hearing first on Kendrick Park, we write minutes, we bring it back to you. It's not like we're doing anything other than listening to people. We're not doing an interview process and screening people out. So I, I feel it's different. Pat. I feel um, that the what OCA did originally was come to the council, share its process, uh, solicit feedback, um, and there were several times and repetitions of that. Um, so I feel like they're doing the same thing now, which I respect. They're saying, this is what we've been working on. These are the changes that we're making. So I do think it's an internal process for them. And I p appreciate their coming to solicit my opinion. But I think that they need to determine what the final process is. Okay. Dorothy. Um. We had, you did mean me? I said Dorothy. Yeah, okay. No, I There was something that came before where somebody announced, and it may have been Alyssa, committees don't make decisions of this type. The council makes these decisions. But I can't remember what that issue was. But I can tell you that as a council member, People have talked to me about appointments. They've talked to me about the rules. They've talked to me about the process. They've talked to me about public CAFs. They've talked to me about this almost as much as they've talked to me about sidewalks. So I think it's a big issue. And I do think that if the council should vote on the process. Now, I, if I were going to make a bet as to whether the, the committee's rules would pass, I would assume that they, they very well likely would, but they would have been then put in place with the vote of the council. So that when people ask about why did you do this or do that, you say we had a vote and that's what it was decided. Darcy. Um, I think the, the issue that you're talking about, Dorothy, came up right after we considered the former uh, OCA process. 
And that's when we came up with, we formulated the rule 10.1, which says that we, no committee will, will take an action that will bind the council. And I assumed that that rule meant the, it applied to this type of situation so that when OCA came back with a new process, that would apply, that we would, that would need a recommendation. I don't really understand why OCA wants this to be an internal process. Um, I, I absolutely believe that it's a council policy. It goes to council, our, our democracy, our inclusiveness, our transparency as a whole council. Uh, and um, Evan elicited input from the full council regarding the proposed process. Why would the whole council need to give input if it's an internal process? Um, we also, um, one of, our, one of our members suggested that this policy, um, once approved and adopted or whatever, become an appendix to our rules. Well, that means it's a town council policy. Um, it's, there's just no doubt in my mind that this is important enough to be a town council policy. Um, and just because a chair of a committee decides something and states it emphatically does not make it so. Thus, I, I really hope that we're going to be able to send this back to OCA with some proposed amendments or ideas that we've given to the committee um, and request that they bring it back to us as a recommendation to the council so that we can have a full council vote on it. Are there additional comments? Mandy Chow. So I agree with what Pat said, that this is an internal process. It does not need the council's vote. We created OCA to make recommendations on who to appoint to these bodies, not on how they make those recommendations. Um, I actually do liken this to some of the finance committee processes that we have not voted on as a council. For example, the finance committee reviews the entire budget the council has not decided how it makes that recommendation to us, who it talks to, when it talks to those, those people, whoever they might be. The council gets a recommendation from the finance committee that says, we recommend you pass or not pass the budget. We don't get the process that says, when we review the budget, here's the 17 or 23 different things we're going to do, and please tell me that that's an okay thing for this committee to do. We didn't get to weigh in on that, and I don't think we should. That's what we assigned the finance committee to do and decide how best they can review that budget to make the recommendation we told them we want them to make. Um, we assigned OCA to figure out how best they can come to figuring out who to recommend to appoint to planning board and ZBA. Um, that's what we have committees for, to figure out how to do those reviews to save this whole council time. So I believe they've done their job to try and make this a completely internal process that will comply with their charge to bring us recommendations on who to appoint. And that's where I would leave it. I appreciate that they did come to us and say, what do you think about this? I don't think they had to. It was nice that they did, though. Andy. Uh, I just want to point out that the committee charge indicates under um, appointments, make recommendations to the town council regarding all appointments by the town council. Um, I think that if... Um, there's dissatisfaction with this, the, then it ought to go back to GOL, which is reviewing uh, the committee charges, but we have a committee charge, and I think that the committee, the OCA committee, has been acting in consistent way with the charge. Are there any other comments on this issue? Shalini. So I'm brain dead at this point, and I can't make a, but I just feel like I need to say something about this issue. 
I feel we're a little divided here and rather than closing down on listening to each other, I think we need to kind of, it feels like to me also that I'm not totally, I, I'm, I'm hearing what Mandy Jo is saying about this. I sort of get it, what you're saying, but somehow this process of, of um, appointing planning board seems really important and critical versus some of the other things. And, and, and I'm not able to yet pinpoint what the difference is because what you're saying sounds really logical, well done, and I can't, I can't seem to come out what a counter argument is, but it still is not satisfying me somehow. This feels like a very important decision. And at this point, I'm not able to figure out what, but I'm not able to ac accept that argument either. Okay. Alyssa. Um, just as every, literally everything we've talked about tonight was covered very well in the report that Evan wrote for on our behalf. Thank you very much, Evan. Um, one of the other things that's mentioned in there is that while indeed these are very important appointments to the town council and the charter makes it clear that these are our appointments, they didn't just put it to the president, for example, they didn't just put it to one person, I would like to remind everyone that while we do have control as a town council over these appointments, there are very many other very powerful bodies in this town that are appointed entirely by the town manager who we have no idea who applied for those positions and he gives us a small amount of information on those people and they make incredibly important decisions that are no less important than what the ZBA or the planning board does. And so I think we do have to consider the larger context as well in terms of what we want people to be attracted to do for us, because we want them to come to us, to come to Planning Board and ZBA, not just go to a very private process that the town manager has. Okay, any other comments at this time? Shamalini? Is this a, it seems like it's a policy though. It's not like an internal process. It's like, I mean, like we're putting it in a rules of procedure and it seems we're not. It's not policy, like how we're going to decide At that. At this point, it is not part of our rules or procedure. Okay. Darcy. I think, I think this particular uh, process is a policy and that we, I, we all have an interest in it. That how this turns out is important to all of us and to all of our constituents. We are answerable to all of our constituents about how this turns out. And these issues are especially important to Amherst residents. Um, so, I mean, the fact that we solicited our input, we are, OCA is inviting the full council to attend the interviews doesn't that tell you that this is a policy of the council? Okay. Evan. No. <laughs> Simply, first of all, I am taken aback by the suggestion that because I solicited feedback from my colleagues that all of a sudden you're morphing that into meaning this is a policy of the town council. He, a policy of the town council, a rule of the town council, is something that is enacted by the town council, that is acted upon by the town council. The appointment itself is acted upon by the town council. The recommendation is wholly OCA. Nothing in this policy requires any action of the town council. Nothing of this policy goes beyond the scope of the operations of OCA. We, it's all leading, the end point of this process is a recommendation that's sent to the town council. Now, yes, planning board and ZBA is important. As Mandy Jo said, so is the budget, right? So I know that CRC has been going through the master plan. I'm interested in that too, Darcy, and I know my constituents are interested in the master plan. That doesn't make that the process that CRC is using to come up with suggested, suggestions on updates to the master plan should be subject to town council review. Their recommendation is what we're going to vote on. And so I don't want us to distort this into seeming like it's something 
everything that happens within that process happens within OCA. Every single step, every action happens within OCA. So there's no way you can call it a policy of the town council if no one who is not an OCA has any contribution to it. And, and so, you know, I, I think that we have to be we have to be sure that we're respecting the operations of our committees. And I think that trying to vote on this is doing the opposite. Is there any other comment at this time? Okay, Pat. I don't really comment, so it's gonna be short. There are a couple of critical things for me that I really appreciate in the policy. One, that I w if I wish to attend the interviews, I can do that um, with limits, and that's okay. It is also important to me, and has been since we first started this whole schmuggy, is that I be able to see who has applied. And there is, you know, the select board got all the CAFs, they looked at it, whether they worked as really giving information or not. I want that information. I also appreciated when we got a report from Paul about the calves when he makes appointments. So there are things I need to know, but I do not need to approve this as a policy because it is not a policy. And if it becomes one, then I, I need to see that there, uh, we create a policy about how finance works because I don't always agree with their decisions. And so therefore, I want a policy or I at least want them to have the respect to come to the council and share how or why they make their recommendations. And we've never asked that, and I don't think it's necessary. Um, that's enough. Okay. Any other comment at this time? Okay, uh, then we're gonna move on to 8E. This is the draft council budget guidelines. Mr. Steinberg. Getting late at night, and uh, so I've been trying to be as brief as I can. I don't think that we're going to get this done tonight, um, and I um, regret that in some ways, but I'm okay with it too. I regret it because, as with the um, count, the, the town manager goals, um, we've got a budget process that's underway, and we're giving guidelines after the budget process has already commenced. But on the other hand, um, because uh, Mr. Bachman's here, he's seen the draft of the document, he knows what's in it, uh, there's no surprises. He's assured me that uh, the two key people who are named as getting copies of it, Mr. Morris and Ms. Sherry, have seen copies of, uh, are aware of the, the key points that relate to the budgets that they're developing. Um, if we don't vote on it tonight, it's okay. Um, this is something that the way it was phrased um, at the um, financial indicator meeting that the finance committee would recommend a um, set of guidelines so that a draft could arise from someplace. But as it was a select board guideline um, in part in the past, that it'd be a council guideline and so that's why it's labeled so prominently draft is because it is just that. Um, what we did was we tried to take the um, select board and finance committee guidelines of the past and um, the select board always was very careful to try and make its guidelines consistent with the town manager goals um, and uh, I was, uh, pleased to see that we came out the same direction this time anyway without having the benefit of having seen the proposed goals in advance. Um, but then I think we probably were working from the same source documents in two different committees at the same time. Uh, the part of it that is um, sort of the financial policy piece um, was a little bit in both sets of guidelines and you've been co given copies of both. And uh, what we were trying to do was to make sure that we covered the key financial policies. And, um, the, but a lot of it, as in the past, 
It was really adopted out of the recommendations that came out of what's now called the financial indicators meeting because um, the, it, it's really the, the source of the financial piece that goes into the actual budget that's being developed and um, the role of the council in the end will be as it, develop, as it adopts guidelines to say, yes, we think those numbers made the most sense. The um, budget piece that was in the financial indicators report. So um, I think I'm going to um, pretty much leave it at that because uh, if I go into more detail, it's really getting into the minutia of all aspects of it. And I think it's better to come up with responding to questions um, as far as uh, answering something that, uh, uh, responding to something that Evan said many hours ago. Um, and that is, uh, why did we put into the um, agenda the ability to um, waive the second reading and proceed in one vote? Um, it was mostly that if there was absolutely no discussion and we got to it at a reasonable hour, um, that it gave the ability to do that. It didn't mean that the motion had to be made to do it, but if you don't put it on the agenda, you can't even consider the motion. So uh, there's no, uh, it, was a, it was a plan to make a judgment call at the time and uh, see what kind of discussion comes forward. So thank you. So there's two options at this point. One is we asked the council if they have brief comments on this. The other option is I send it out and ask you to send your individual comments to Andy and he come back with any changes at our meeting on the 6th. I do need to note that the Finance Committee has only one meeting scheduled in between the two meetings and it's tomorrow. <laughs> Except that it's gonna start snowing at four o'clock this morning. Is it really? That's by two of my three weather sources. <laughs> we have um, to have yeah, we're going to be out by four, I, I promise you. All right, are there any council comments on this? I have a comment. It's a great document, and thank you, Andy. <laughs> I second that comment. Is there anything else? Yes, Alyssa? I was going to say that despite having great sympathy for uh, not suspending a rule over and over again, I was actually going to be willing to vote for this tonight because I thought it was close enough to exactly the kinds of things we've been talking about and based on past practice. So I'm good with it. I'm not sure how much more refining is really going to make a difference in how useful it is. And Evan's over here chomping at the bit because he doesn't want us to suspend rule 8.4. Any other comments? Yeah, if I could. Please. Yep. I just do want to add actually one thing, and that is um, if you're going to look at anything, I would look in the bottom of page five and the top of page six because um, that's where we put in that if uh, sort of the, the, the suggestions of things to consider if additional funds are available to do that. And, I, and that is an important piece. And, uh, you know, I think that it left the Finance Committee on that one without having the prior guidance of previous documents, but to use our knowledge of issues that have arisen before this group and to make a good faith attempt to start. But um, that's one section that I would want to make sure that people don't neglect looking at. Are there any comments on that section? Alyssa? Please. I think that we can go ahead and vote for this because if we come back six month, a month from now and the finance committee says, you know what, we totally should have said something else, so we fix it then. Right. So we add to it. It's fine. And so right. 
Do I have to move? Would you like to, to make to, a motion? Do I have to move to? You have to make a motion to suspend <laughs> Rule 8.4. Try not to throw anything at me. No. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Is there any further discussion? Evan? So my notes for this are all, yes, I support this, good job. And so given, and given the fact that all the comments would be, yeah, looks good, and there's only one meeting before the next meeting, and it's tomorrow, and I want to go to bed, I will actually support this motion. All right, all those in favor of suspending Rule 8.4, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. All right, then we move on to adopt the draft council budget guidelines as presented in the document entitled FY21 Council Budget Guidelines Draft. Is there a motion? Could, could we make that motion but take out the word draft and uh, just simplify it a little? That just says it's that document. We're, we're accepting the Finance Committee okay, budget so it policy would, guidelines. So it would read to adopt the council budget guidelines as presented in the document entitled FY21 Council Budget Guidelines. We're question. too tired to fix it at this point. Uh, I'm just, I see that this agenda item was added in late. No, it was because it was missed. It wasn't meant to be added late. It was posted, but it, it got in, it, there was, because people kept sending things in early, and we kept wanting to make sure people got stuff as early as possible. This was in that group, but then it didn't get posted somehow, and I'm sorry about that. Right, this is the first, I know, I copied a previous agenda, so I didn't know this was on the agenda. Is there any further conversation, questions? Do you have the motion on the floor? Okay, the motion is to, is to adopt the council budget guidelines as presented in the document entitled FY21 Council Budget Guidelines as amended. Is there a second? second? Any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Okay. All right. Uh, the liaisons, amendments to rules of procedure. This is the second reading. This is rules of procedure 10.1. We previously read this. It's with regard to liaisons. Are there any, is there any further discussion? George? Um, you have, this actually has been um, wordsmithed a bit since you last saw it um, in response to comments made at a meeting that now seems a very, very long time ago. Um, and so um, hopefully everyone's had a chance to look at it. It has the track changes in there. Um, very briefly, um, comments that I made in my GOL report at that meeting um, were put into the first paragraph to further clarify the function and purpose of a liaison. And a couple of minor changes, F, we added the, comment, uh, the uh, phrase, and are not to speak on behalf of the council. That was, I think, in response to something Andy had brought up. Um, so there's some uh, changes that you see in front of you. Um, otherwise, it's ready for prime time. Any questions? Dorsey. I just want to say that this sounds much friendlier. OK. Thank you. All right. Uh, so the motion is to rescind the current rules of, rule of procedure 10.8, counselors as non-voting liaisons, and replace it with revised rule 10.8 as presented by GOL in the document entitled ROP 10.9 Liaisons, Ryan Revisions 11-19-2019, as amended at a meeting, at meeting. Is there a motion? So, I yes. I'll move that. <laughs> Is there a second? I will second. 
George. Can I just say next time we'll have a better <laughs> wording? I, I realized late last the best night title that of a we document? hadn't gotten the right version to you guys, and so I just cut and pasted, and that's what I labeled it at a meeting. <laughs> all right, all those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. aye. Opposed? Abstain? I know when to bring things to this group. It's at 11.45 at night. All right, approval of minutes. Uh, we're going to do these as two different minutes. The first one is to amend minutes we've already approved, and I am personally making this request, and we have gone back and looked at the tape, because in the tape we, re we did say that President Griesmer stated that per Charter Section 5.2, the town manager shall call a meeting of the budget coordinating group, which shall consist of the town manager representatives of the town council, school committee, regional school committee, library board of trustees. This meeting will be considered a meeting of the whole of the budget coordinating committee. And that I stated that in an attempt to make sure that that satisfied the requirement of the charter that they have that meeting. So the motion is to amend the minutes of November 7th, 2019 to include that statement. So, mo so moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, is there further discussion? Okay, then all those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate your approval. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. Okay. And then we have two other sets of minutes, November 18th. We do have two other sets of minutes? Yes. And December 4th, I'm sorry. Are there any questions on either of those minutes? Okay, to approve the minutes of the November 18th, 2019 regular town council meeting and the December 4th, 2019 special council meeting as presented. Is there a motion? I so move. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? One, two, three, four. So it's nine in favor, none against, and four abstentions. Okay. Um, There are no appointments. On committee reports, audit, nothing, right? Pat, audit? <laughs> the audit committee will be meeting at the end of January to work on an RFP. Thanks. Uh, and Sonia Aldridge will be part of that meeting. Bylaw review committee, already done. Committee res community res and remind we need to re dissolve that committee at our next meeting. Community Resources Committee. I will just give a very quick verbal report, which is we'll have a written report for the next meeting. We are working on presenting a process to you as directed in the referral for the master plan review process that hopefully will come in front of you on January 6th. Um, we are also working on re recommending back on the downtown parking working group priority recommendations that may be as early as the 6th, but I'm guessing that's more likely the 27th. Um, and then we're going to be discussing some zoning process and hopefully some transportation things. I will be at the request of the planning board presenting the draft process on Wednesday um, of this week at their meeting around 8 o'clock p.m. I think they said is when they might get to me. Um, so you guys all want to know when, if the committee votes on Wednesday morning. I will try to get that memo out to you if it has been <coughs> voted on before I go to the planning board meeting in the evening because they will have requested a, they have requested if we do vote in the morning a copy <coughs> of the final memo that's coming to the council. And so I feel like it should come to the council before it's handed to the planning board. So I will try to make th that happen. So that's it for now. Written report next time. Okay, town manager and council goals. We've already done our work today. Finance Committee, Andy, anything else? Okay. George, anything on GOL? Just 
draw the attention of the council to that the fact the committee is currently considering is currently reviewing town council committee structure and in your packet is a, a memorandum from the chair describes the goals that we are using to guide this review and gives you a little bit of a, a glimpse of what we're considering this is uh, obviously just work in progress but our goal is to have a report to you for the next meeting with suggestions as to how we think um, the council committee structure might be refashioned to achieve the goals that are uh, stated here in the memorandum. And any uh, comments, thoughts, or suggestions you might have, you can send to me, um, and I would incorporate them in our discussion. Or you're welcome to come on Wednesday. At uh, no, I'm seeing if so much. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> you are certainly welcome to come on Wednesday um, at, at 10:30. So is GLL also looking at the issue of public way safety parking? It is. Um, it's okay. 10 to midnight, but uh, I could be happily talk about that. Um, no, it's, no, we never talk about parking after 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> never. I, all I did was ask if you were. Thank you. That's all I want to know. Oka? So real quick, you might remember a long time ago you uh, referred liaisons to us yes. um, that we kept putting on the back burner to get through this process. Now that that process has been adopted, OCA is meeting uh, sort of at an off-cycle meeting this Friday at 11 a.m., and we are finally going to dig into liaisons. So expect uh, some report on liaisons from us at the January 6th meeting. Okay. Is that a special meeting? <laughs> It's always special. <laughs> Percent for our agenda. <laughs> Percent for our Kathy. Uh, very quickly, we did get to the point we reached full consensus, unanimous on a revised version of the Percent for Art um, and a report on the major changes we made. It has gone through Lynn to be sent out again to committees. So the two committees that'll be reviewing that revision are CRC and finance, and it's on the finance agenda for tomorrow. So okay. it's also posted if you, original bylaw, revised bylaw, rationale for the changes. Okay, Paul, what two words would you like to say? <laughs> I've got a number of things, but I'm going to say them. If you have more questions, you can ask me. State of the town, first crack, um, open to suggestions on how to do it better. Capital projects for listing sessions um, went very well. Curi um, follow up on that. Um, four towns meeting was held. Uh, no action was taken at the four towns meeting. There's a smart growth workshop on Thursday at 645 in this room. Um, January uh, 18th, MLK breakfast. Please sign up for that. And uh, the school committee's meeting tomorrow night is canceled because there's no school. They had already thought this through, so they, their meeting is now scheduled for Wednesday at um, 6 p.m. at the high school library. This is where they're going to talk about uh, expanding early childhood education. And on the MSBA, I have a number of things, but I think uh, I was going, the, the school superintendent is going to make a presentation to the school committee now on Wednesday. Um, I think rather than, I don't want to step on his toes because it's really a school project. And so I'll make a similar presentation after, um, after he makes his presentation. Thank you. Um, just very quickly, uh, thank you for all for attending the uh, listening sessions. Everyone came to at least once. Several key people came to three or four of them. The uh, capital investment listening sessions, additional comments are open until December 20th. Those comments will then be blended in to the comments that were received during the listening sessions by the consultants, and that report will be available. Um, and two other things. At this point in time, and, and end until further notice, all standing and ad hoc committee appointments continue as they presently stand. Uh, once we have reviewed the committee charges and voted on changes and voted on president and vice president, we'll see what happens. Um, the next thing is that House 28, 2810 uh, did, was brought to our attention and it is my understanding that um, a counselor has stepped forward and suggests said that they would be willing to sponsor a resolution. Okay. 
Is there any other question of me at this point? Yes. The, that's coming. Who is the counselor? The early, it's Pat. <laughs> you can do it together, Just whatever you want to do. So at a future meeting? It would be a future meeting. Um, I do think that um, there is a time pressure for this particular request. I'm, I'm going to leave that up to you all to figure out. So people can send in, you know, you can click on the link in the letter that was sent out so that you can send individual, individually as municipal officials. Um, and this is a bill that's supported by, uh, you know, it's a top priority of the Mass Power Forward Coalition, which is a coalition of like 200 organizations. So it's one of <clears throat> it's one of their top three priorities. So definitely worth supporting as a municipal official. Steve. Is there any word on the retreat that we are holding dates for? No, we're February? going to have to go back and, and um, poll again because we don't seem to be able to come up with a very good date. Okay. But so I'll so check we back. We can release all those dates. I, I will check tomorrow with Athena and get back to you. On, so don't give up dates yet, okay? And Mandy Jo may know more about her dates because one of those was that. The other thing is... Uh, the um, people from 132 Northampton Road, the Valley CDC, has offered to come to one of our meetings, and so I've invited them to come to our meeting on the 6th and give us an update, since many people have been asking, including the residents of the area. Are there any other future agenda items? Yes. Yes, future agenda item, following up on what Darcy said. When people tell us to write and sign letters individually as town councilors, that is something that I think we need to talk about as a group as okay. to what our policy is, because in the past, I look so shocked, um, in the past, uh, the select board did not do that. We were a different kind of body, but we were elected officials, and we said if the select board had an opinion on something, then yes, we would sign off on it. But we didn't say, I'm a select board member, and I think this, because then everybody thinks your select board thought that, just as they will think your okay. town council thinks that. And so we probably need to figure out if there are lines in there someplace. Oh, and maybe it's a referral to a committee. Um, okay. Any other future agenda items, councilor comments? M yes? I just have a question for the town manager. Um, I just wondered if you could update us on um, resident capital requests, if some came in and what they were about. Um, I think one came in, uh, and that would be going to JCPC. I don't have the list for you, though. We'll get more information for you. Okay. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. Aye. aye.